So I love letting you, you're also a great talker. So please talk away. This is, this is your space to do it. But today my guest is a dear friend. He is my former sports law professor. He is a former major league baseball agent and now criminal law attorney to some of the most prolific athletes and celebrities and rappers. You can you can acknowledge it. You yeah. can just say yes. There's we're, a few of them for sure. <laughs> we're not we're not we're not going to name them. Don't worry. All I'm right. going to keep them. But may the innocent go I unnamed. will say your roster is pretty impressive. Your your kids are pretty impressed by them as well. Yes, you, definitely. My, you've, yes, you've had some rapper clients I, that you had no idea who they were until you talked. Absolutely, about them. yes. Uh, I'll never forget uh, coming back from the World Baseball Classic one day at Dodger Stadium a few years ago when uh, when the uh, World Baseball Classic championship was going on, and my oldest son, who was in high school at the time, uh, we were just hanging out in the car. We're waiting in the parking lot because it was packed. And always at Dodger Stadium. And yeah, of course, my client calls my rapper client and I had no idea who he is. I thought he's just some random rapper. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I, his name came up on the dashboard on my car and my son's like, who's that? And I told me, he's like, he's a client of mine. What? what? And I said, yes. So, um, he went and told his friends that of course I represented so-and-so and I'm like, Hey, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I didn't talk to my client in front of him. Of course I knew yeah, that much, yeah, but yeah, he yeah. saw his name come up. Do they rec- do they understand the concept of, of confidentiality by nature of your job? So as my wife and my kids will tell you, I speak loudly. And so Likewise. I have a tendency, right. And so I work from home, you know, most of the time, except when I'm in court and stuff like that. Uh, post COVID, I kind of gave up my office, so I, I have to be cognizant of how high and loud I'm talking. What? Sometimes, exactly. Sometimes my my wife would be like, "Yeah, you you were too loud in there. And I heard <laughs> everything you're saying." I'm like, "Well, <laughs> it's a problem." So I got to be yes, I have to be careful, and and they do. I've had that conversation with my with my two of my sons. I would imagine you would have to Absolutely. at that point, especially if you work from home. Absolutely. I, speaking of the same rapper client, actually. Um, I have kind of a big brother, you know, relationship with him. So, uh, unfortunately, I was getting passionate and yelling at him kind of on the <laughs> phone <laughs> because, you know, he's posting him smoking weed uh, on Instagram and all of that. And I was yelling. I'm saying, hey, you can't do this. It's part of your probation. You cannot, you know, post yourself doing drugs. It's a probation violation and you're holding it out to the court and to the world and the prosecutor that you're violating probation. You can't do that. On probation? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. My God. And so um, he's like, well, uh, you know, I thought you told me once my drug patch got taken off. I was, I'm like, no, 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 no. Right? So my son, who is in the other room, comes in. He's like, hey, I heard you yelling at me. And I was like, yeah, that's. <laughs> we don't talk yes. about that. Did anybody see it? Or did he, were you able to, to catch it before it? No, it, it, it's. It was, I monitor his social media um, and some of my clients' social media for sure that because they have a tendency to post whatever it is that they're doing at the time, which may or may not be issues with the court, you know what I mean, from a criminal perspective. So it happens all the time. That's insane. So how many clients would you say that you have to monitor their social media, which is now part of your job description? I probably three or four. Three or four of them, yeah. That that I are have they to just reckless? They're absolutely reckless, and 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 not only are they reckless, but I think that they come from the perspective of you know what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen, and not only that, but this is what my fans want. This is what. This but is, is what it expected? It. I. I. I guess the not, the right? lawyers in the room would be like, "Is I, it worth it?" It's to me, it's not right, and and. Part of the frustration is that I ultimately have to deal with it in court. You know what I mean? Because I have been dragged in to court because of this same client's social media three other times. And there were two of those, two of the three times there were probation violations that the court actually found. And he was remanded into custody. And then what do you do? You're just like, I mean, so you, sad, too you, bad. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, we talked about this before. Part of my, I, I think, somewhat to my own detriment is I become 
too involved, emotionally involved with my clients. And I, and I have a tendency to, to do that. And I have to be careful of that. You know what I mean? I become, you know, I, I take on a role that I think I, I can really help more than I really can. Right. As we know, as lawyers, um, it, it can be tough. You know what I mean? And so, um, there comes a fine point where you can advise your clients and you can, you know, tell them to your blue in the face and explain to them the ramifications of their actions. But at the end of the day, ultimately it's their decision and they're going to conduct their life how they want to, to their detriment in, in those situations. Damn. Yeah. Which has got to cause you a whole bunch of stress if you go to sleep, not knowing if client X is going to be posting on Twitter or Instagram or their stories or go on live and say something absolutely stupid. No doubt. And, and I will get calls from people friends that know I represent, you know, the client and, and say, Hey, did you see, have you seen this? And I'm like, Oh geez. What? Is it just drug use or are there other things that you tell them? Drug and guns. Yeah. Those are the big ones. What is it about because the rappers and, and the guns thing? I think it's, when I say cultural, I don't mean, I mean cultural in the sense of the hip hop industry, For right? Sure. That, that's become part and, and it's, and encompasses kind of everything that at least they're selling. Yeah. Right? right. Not that it's real life necessarily, but it's what they're marketing and they're selling to the public. Um, and, you know, it, he's on a, he's not supposed to have any guns and drugs. And of course, he's posted those things. He's also has a stay away order um, uh, from, from a person. And, one of his violations was he posted, uh, he was posted in an area where he was close Oh by. my God. Yeah. So those are things that you, you. This is stuff that like makes me lose my mind. I'm it, just like, this is so common sense. Yeah. Not even from a lawyer's perspective, from just a, hey, here's a rule you cannot break. And the other thing is they have a, sometimes have a false sense of security because I have a lawyer. I have. And they illegal. have a good lawyer. Well, thank you. But, You're welcome. But there's, as you well know, there's only so much we can do. Right, right? but it does. There's totally a false sense of security false that comes security. from protecting your clients. They go, oh, JD's going to get me out of exactly. anything that I get in trouble with. And, and like, no, no, JD is not going to get you out of that. There's no way JD can get you out of that. Yeah, and those are unfortunately lessons they have to learn the hard way, you know, Um but it is what it is. And, and you want to be successful, right? That's what our ultimate goal is yeah. as, as lawyers, right? To represent our clients in the most positive and, and, and successful light as we possibly can. But at the end of the day, there's only so much we can do, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm very excited today. And I was talking about you to somebody the other day. You are one of the few people, and I don't mean that to like sound negative, but that made me really excited to be a lawyer because you were one of the few people that were just an amazing storyteller and talked about especially sports from a perspective that I never really thought about it before, especially from the sports agency a aspect of it. You always started your sports law classes by talking about what was current events in sports, and we would normally take positions or sides and either debate them or talk about them. So I did want to start off today by talking about some things in sports is there anything that you can think of before i go ahead that was like that's been piquing your interest in in the sports world recently i'm gonna just jump in i don't mean okay. to interrupt you f1 have you followed anything that's going on in vegas at all you know i i haven't really followed it but i did see that they were having issues with the track and the and and they started it and stopped it, canceled the race. It was a practice race in less than 10 minutes. Right. Because there was like a sewer grate that stripped one of the Ferraris to like pieces. Right. I'm nervous about it. And not only that, but I think the ticket prices have plummeted, right? They, they, you know, they were exorbitant to begin with, like everything else, right? Concert tickets, you know, every, everything is so exorbitant right now, right? And, and obviously those have come down to earth a little bit. I think they're let, selling at 50% of the original value you know yeah I, mean? I think the bellagio was charging like 30 grand for a dinner table reservation to sit which essentially the founds are now blocked to get a bird's eye view of the actual race on saturday night i don't think it's that much anymore because that's 
astronomical. And I do know my sister and my nieces live in Vegas. So oh. I actually talked to my niece in Vegas, just talking to her the other day, and she said, it's a mess. It's an absolute nightmare. The residents nightmare. are absolutely pissed off about The residents, the employees. Yes. I was talking, I was there a week ago, and the valet was so not happy about it. No one that works there is happy about it because they're just all inconveniencing them. They, I went there in July and traffic was dead stopped on Las Vegas Boulevard because of that traffic. Almost a year, that yeah. whole thing. I, I'm just, I'm sitting here going, uh, if, if a sewer grate took out a practice run vehicle, what is it going to do for the drivers? Absolutely. And if something happens to one of those drivers, and I'm saying it now, who's going to be liable? Because I would argue that, I mean, this thing has so clearly been a mess from the start. The build out, the construction, two people died, which as horrible as it, it sounds to say, I think every major stadium build has come with a, a couple of deaths, which is, I wouldn't say it's okay at all. But it almost seems like it's normal until people get their shit together. Right. But no, yeah, no doubt about it. It's the liability. Um, the 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 liability that the, the entities have out there is is tremendous. And as lawyers, as you well know, you know that is that is where we operate. Right. That is where 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 they wanted a race. Yes. Oh, the Michigan sign stealing. You hear about yes the three game suspension for Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. Yes. What do you think about that? So I, this was a topic we discussed in, in my sports law class, um, and we've discussed the last couple of weeks. And and <clears throat> the issue the issue for us, is, as we talked about, is where's the line, right? Where's the line between, you know, quote unquote cheating and, and where's the line in, in, you know, competitive advantages that are being taken and stuff like that, right? Um, I th And I've talked to my former clients and my current clients and friends that are whether they're coaches or players and still active. And, and I think what's consistent, and I kind of agree, what's consistent is um, competitive advantage and, and sign stealing specifically uh, is acceptable if, if, if used, you know, if not used using other methods and means technology. above technology to do it, right? Um, the issue is what is Michigan doing? What were they doing? You know, from a technological standpoint, I can tell you that you know a number of years ago, just a small experience that I had with it is um, my former best friend was a former USC assistant baseball coach um, for many years, and there was an issue um, that um, another coach from another rival school uh, in the Pac-12 uh, had been videotaping practices and stuff like that from the baseball team. And that was done under the guise of they were trying to find um, NCAA violations of, of, play, of coaches um, with players during the dark periods, right, where they couldn't practice together. That has, that stuff like that has gone on, I know that. Um, Is that the answer? He, what's that? Is that the reason, though? Is that the reason what? The, the, you said that they, they said they were trying to find NCAA violations? Correct. And they were actually trying to find NCAA? Absolutely. Okay. They were absolutely trying to do that in order to, to turn, turn the program in, you know what I mean, for, for NCAA vi actions. You know what I mean? So stuff like that has been going on for, for a long time. You know, it gets back into the Astros, you know, with the you know, beating of the trash cans. Trash cans. And, and, you know, the Boston Red Sox with the uh, eye watches, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. So... Part of the game is from a baseball perspective, at least, you know, is, is, you know, the opposing coaches and players attempting to pick the signs of the opposing players. That's been going on forever, and that's forever. totally acceptable, right? I think that's part of the game. Um, but using technology, stuff like that, I think falls outside the bounds, you know, for sure. Um, what is the punishment for that, you know what I mean? And yeah. what kind of processes are you going to put in place to, to, you know, cut down on that as it and if it's been happening for so long, why you pick this person to be the scapegoat of every? And of course, Michigan fans are calling it conspiracy theory, right? Yeah. For the first time in many years, they're you know one of the potential you know candidate or How you know, dare, yeah. team to be a national champion, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that that you know that that goes hand in hand, you know. But um, I think that 
Jim Harbaugh, I guess, has been feigning, you know, ignorance. You know what I mean? But there is one funny clip that he's not ignorant. Of course he's not. Of Come course on. he's not. Of course he's not. Everyone knows just the the right amount of rules that they can like skate. Over Plausible deniability all right, day, every day. Sure I mean, I guess if you were representing him, that would be your advice, right? Of course. Yeah, you were not sure. Oh no, that he, he's if the, you weren't he's sure, he's the head of he's the head coach. He's not involved in in the lower level goings ons between assistant coaches and and people like that. That's not what he's doing. He's focusing on the bigger picture, the grand picture. You've always told me something though. What do you, what do you what have you always said about coaches and managers? What's that? Well, I guess as it relates to baseball. Well, What's you've it? always told me that they know everything. Oh, like nothing of happens in in a clubhouse or or you, any sort of dre- like locker room without. You do not, in my opinion, you do not get to be at that level, right? And, um, and not under understand the culture that you're dealing in, uh, and know the people and what is going on in your locker room or your in in and with your players. And with your organization, you absolutely know, and they know everything that's going on. I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. By the way, this is all legend. This is I'm all just a, our opinions. Uh, I'm gonna. Correct. This will be the the very quick point where I put a page long legal disclaimer, non solicitation notice, right. all of the legal mumbo jumbo that I have to put up in here. I, you know, what's funny? I understand now as a lawyer. Whenever I would draft legal waiver language for something and everybody's like, this is a little bit long to put on an ad or, or, you know, socials, like, can, can you come up with something shorter? And I'm like, I mean, you want something all inclusive here it is. But now I'm like, as I'm making this podcast, realizing like, oh, I need it. How do I make this, all of this language fit on this right here? But don't worry, that'll be covered. I, I'm going to, I'm going to say it now. I'll say it again. This is none of this is legal advice. None of this is personalized legal advice. This is all just our legal opinion. And I wanted to provide some education for people that maybe don't know the legal side of sports or criminal law. Um, so that was Michigan. There was somebody else. Jimbo Fisher was the next one. Jimbo Fisher from Texas A&M was Texas fired, Texas A&M right? fired in his sixth season with more than $76 million remaining on his fully guaranteed same thing with the Michigan State uh, coach that was fired for, um, you know, for sexual impropriety, alleged sexual improprieties, right? That's an interesting story. Are you, are you aware uh-huh. of that story? Oh, Tell okay. Me. So the head coach of, of Michigan State um, had signed a, I believe it was, he was in the second year of a eight-year, $92 million deal, I think. Oh Don't quote God. me on the, the numbers, but... It's a ninety million dollar deal in the second year of that deal, and he was recently terminated by the university for violating their um, sexual harassment, uh, harassment policy. policy. The sexual alleged sexual harassment policy actually comes with there has been a sexual harassment advocate who was a former um, a victim of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And she had been an advocate going forward and had been, um, it was an advocate for Division One and, and Division Two uh-huh. football programs and sports programs. She would come in on campus and talk to the players about sexual harassment, about sexual assault, and all of the different things, you know what I mean, that, that encompass, you know, the, the sexual, you know, assault and, and harassment uh, realm. And the allegations are that the head coach and her somewhat formed a personal relationship. And that the, per, the extent of the personal relationship is that issue. He says they were in an intimate relationship. She says absolutely not. He was fired, and allegedly he had sexually harassed her uh, over the phone. And I don't know if we're going to say it, if we can say it on the podcast. But, yeah, yeah, I'll bleep but, it out if I need to. But had master <laughs> during a phone call with her. How did she? Well, and she reported him to the university. Now she's not a university employee, but she wait. So she reported it. She reported immediately it immediately after it happened. I'm not sure about what the temporal elements were. I don't know what time frame is, but she reported of it. Of course, after it he's going to say it was an intimate relationship. That's his only move, right? the <laughs> The idea is that it was like a 30, 35 minute phone call. He alleges that that it, you know they were having, they, yes, um, and so. 
he was fired recently in the second year of his deal. And he's demanding the rest of his of money. Of course he is. Oh, and my that, that, God. That is, and the arguments are, well, she was not even an employee of the university and technically under the policy. Maybe that... God, they probably won't pay him. Maybe they'll give him, like, the smallest of settlements, but I hope they don't. I hope they don't pay him. Uh, yeah, I mean, the amount of money that's left on that contract, you know, 60-plus million, I believe, that, that, is, that is left on that contract, I think that's probably going to be an issue, right? That, uh, from, from, a, from a... You say more? You say more. It's more, it's more money? Eight years and 80 left. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Uh, so that... There, I don't think he's going to be. I think he's going to be seeking an, a substantial settlement, to say the least. Or they'll try that case. Oh right? my God! How do you think Texas A? How do you think Texas A and M feels though, spending seventy six million dollars on somebody that it, it was just poor. They just didn't like the way he was coaching, right? right, right. It wasn't a, a scandal. They have to pay for. I don't know. A oh bad yeah, he decision. wasn't fired for cause. No. Yeah, so he wasn't fired for cause. So I'd likely. Not. I'd be pissed if I went to that school knowing you're paying seventy six million dollars for somebody to do nothing. Just goes to show you the amount of money that is involved in the NCAA and with these programs, right? The amount of revenue that's being generated. That you know to terminate a contract like that with that remaining balance is is it says I think volume. Speaking of, we'll go into it now. And I want, for anybody that doesn't understand, I'm just going to give a really brief introduction into what we were talking about, which is name, image, and likeness. And when I say name, image, and likeness, I am talking about the three things that make up a right of publicity, which are inherent in every individual to be able to make money off of or use for endorsement or sponsorship deals. So just a little bit of a background. Prior to 2021, student athletes were prohibited by NCAA bylaws that they were not allowed to seek out any endorsement or sponsorship contracts on their own. The schools had a right to and were allowed to make as much money as they wanted to by using uh, name a name a a really top rated athlete student athlete Shador Sanders let's go with Shador, Shador Sanders, Sanders right he's the he's the most popular Caleb Williams you know those guys yeah, yeah, are yeah. the most popular guys right now so the- prior to 2021 they would not have been able to go to Nike and get their own endorsement deal however right. the colleges that they play for would have in 2021 the supreme court decided that those NCAA bylaws NCAA bylaws violated antitrust rules and now permitted any student athlete to be able to take advantage of their name, image, and likeness rights going forward. So now we've kind of opened the floodgates for student athletes to be able to essentially market themselves to get deals that maybe that they otherwise wouldn't. One one question I want to ask you, ask you, which I did not actually come up with on my own. Do you ever, did you know who Theo Vaughn is? Yeah, of course, the comedian. Yeah, yes. so he has a podcast. I have been scouring the internet to find information or topics or people talking about this issue, and of the only person that has asked was even Theo a remotely thought-provoking question on this issue was Theo Vaughn, and he asked, he said, with name, image, and likeness now being allowed for student-athletes, do you think it affects the play of the game for say, students who maybe wanted to go pro before, but maybe maybe wouldn't have made without it unless question. they tried, right? Uh, without question. I think Shadur Sanders is actually potentially the first uh, test case for that. Now, he has come out, his father, Deion Sanders, has come out and said that he is coming back to school next year, right? Because mm-hmm. he's a junior right mm-hmm. now. Um, I think, and he's projected at least to be a first-round pick you know, where he goes at the top half, bottom half, that's been debated. But he's projected to be a first-round pick if he came out of the draft today, right? Or this year. Um, and they said he's coming back. Now, that decision is made a lot easier if he does, in fact, come back. That decision is made a lot easier because he's able to exploit his name, image, and likeness mm-hmm. rights and be paid while he is, you know, playing his senior year, right? Versus previously, Players could not be paid, right? Mm-hmm. Or at least they weren't being paid the amount of money that they're being paid now on yeah. the up and up, right? Yeah. You know, 
Um, so, you know, it makes that decision um, a potential real decision in the process, right? Because Shador Sanders, well, now I can exploit my name, image, and likeness, so I'm going to be paid and be able to make money while I'm still participating in, in the NCAA. Right? And now I don't have to kill my back. Correct, right? There. Exactly. So it, I think it absolutely, absolutely has a decision for those top-end players, right? It, right. We're just talking about that top 0.5% of players out there that are that are there, or even smaller than that, right? That, mm -hmm. that don't risk injury and risk their career or risk – a certain amount of money by going back to school when they say, Hey, look, I need to get you know paid now because I need to protect myself and my future. Now with those players making that type of money, they are able to stay in school potentially. Yeah. Right? Um, that's always been my argument before from with the NCA perspective. And that is, it goes back to the agent thing. I think, you know, with the agent, no agent rule from the NCA's perspective, I thought they just always had that ass backwards. I think that, they should encourage and should have encouraged players, NCA players, to seek the advice of competent counsel, competent agents and representatives who would give them the best advice on whether they should or shouldn't come out early, whether they should or shouldn't declare for the draft, right? I think that only helps the NCA because every year you would you have players that have no business declaring for the NFL draft because they they have an unrealistic um, belief of where they're gonna go and ultimately not only do they hurt themselves, but the NCAA product is hurt because they're losing these players who ultimately might become the stars of the, of the next year, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought they've had that backwards. But aim, image, and likeness has been a game changer, right? And it's the Wild West out there wild right now. Wild West. Of, of things. And, and it's a Wild West from a legal perspective, too, because um, I think most players, most of these young athletes are getting bad advice, right? They're, they're entering into bad deals. Uh, they're potentially entering into long-term deals and sacrificing the future of their name, image, and likeness rights and their ability to exploit their name, image, and likeness uh, to their maximum extent by signing and taking, you know, a few thousand bucks today. Um, be, and it's a money grab, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're losing sight of the long-term picture and the long-term ability to maximize how much money they can make on their name, image, and likeness by just taking a small amount of money because there's people around them that are encouraging them to do this and they're making money on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's to the detriment of the players. Right. Sure. Uh, and, and there's a lot of people act. I think 90, I mean, putting percentages, but let's just say the absolute vast majority of, of those that are advising and representing players from a name, image and likeness perspective are not competent. Number mm -hmm. one or number two, acting, acting, you know, outside of the scope of the state laws mm -hmm. regarding name, image, and likeness representation. Just for some backstory, because we've talked about this before, but there is almost an insurgence of, I wouldn't even call them companies. They are marketing agencies. They're marketing themselves out to be NIL agents, which when you actually go through the books, it doesn't really turn out to be anything other than what I would be the un, uncertified practice of law the unlawful practice of law without having a law license or being a certified agent. And have you noticed an influx of these NIL agents as I have that are essentially putting themselves out to be um, brand deal experts for student athletes? Everybody. Lot, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, there's a scan, very scandalous and unfortunate and tragic uh, uh, story going on right now, actually, in Orange County, right? Um, so part of the things that, that is prevalent right now, obviously, is all the personal coaching, right, for young athletes right now at the youngest of ages, starting off at six years old with private coaching. And, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy the amount of money that's being generated and, and paid by parents to train their kids, right, to, in their hopes, ultimately get a Division One scholarship, be a professional athlete. It's craziness. But there has been a huge influx of these private trainings, tri private training programs and trainers that have popped up. Um, before it was the, you know, the old UAAA, right, mm -hmm. um, you know, these super teams that were developed that mainly happened in, in, ba in basketball. Now the personal training side has become the big thing, right? And there, there was a firm, a, a, a personal training school in Orange County that 
um, operated be with ages between five and high school and college players, okay? And these trainers had been training these kids um, as they go through. And there's and um, Bryce Young was a former former uh, student uh, athlete that was trained there. Uh, DJU, the quarterback from from Oregon State, a number of high profile from college same... athletes from this same place. Now they're trained by a number of places, but were linked to this place. Well, one of the alleged founders, right, of of the school was arrested last year for um, sexual assault on a minor uh, woman, or minor girl, child, right? And is currently being prosecuted for it in Orange County Court. And he was There's one of the so founders. Of exactly, right? He's one of the founders. But he and that, that some of the partners, I believe, from that, from that firm had tried, had started a name, image, and likeness company <laughs> because what they were trying to do is trying to represent these young athletes as they, as they went through the program, right? And these athletes looked to them, right? And they were starting a name, image, and likeness firm on the side. Um, and he was doing that, right? And I think, and these are, I, I mean, from what I know and what I, what I know about the story is these aren't, uh, professionals in 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 the law and, and negotiating contracts and negotiating marketing contracts and in branding and licensing and all those things. Um, and the other the other issue they have is, you know, most of the agents I think and and advisors in the state of California specifically because that's where we are now um, don't abide by and are not you know and are running afoul of the Miller IL Act, which is the state licensing. Um, statute on the books for the for the state of California. What people don't know in this space, I think, right now, and what I anticipate is is a ripe level of potential litigation going on in the future, and that is um, anybody that's negotiating a contract or representing a player in in exploiting the name, image, and likeness rights needs to be licensed under California's Miller Ayala Act, right? And if you're not licensed. Under the, under the Miller Ayala Act, and you've negotiated a contract and an issue arises, then your client can sue you, obviously. Um, not only could you potentially be uh, liable in both criminally and civilly for any damages that are, that are, uh, have potentially occurred, but there's a disgorgement of profits aspect to the Miller Ayala Act, where a, a client that's harmed, right, can you have a disgorgement of profits from all the profits that that their that their alleged nil agent has 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 been. I think there's going to be a wave of lawsuits, and if there aren't, I'm going to just streamline them and just like <laughs> seek them out myself. Yes. Because the amount of people that I know that are not lawyers or yes. agents who are seeing this as an opportunity to just make money off of athletes, where this is, it's an industry where athletes are already so taken advantage of. And the fact that there's so many people out there just seeing dollar signs on an opportunity without actually having um, a safe regard for making those deals right and making sure they're done correctly and also not sacrificing anybody's NCAA eligibility because there's a big one with that too. If you go out and get the wrong deal, you might no longer be eligible to play for a school if you're, say, a student. Um I've noticed so many of them that, and I'm noticing a lot of professional agents, and you don't have to opine on this, I will, that are now taking up space in the college NIL space. And to me, it seems like a huge conflict because you're now going to be representing high school and college athletes where you're already representing professionals, but you are not allowed to seek out them as high school or student, yeah. high school or college athletes otherwise, but now you're allowed to because Absolutely. you're an NF NIL agent. That's exactly that. That's what the And I know they are. are. I know the that's big exactly athlete agencies are already doing it. All of, well, no. Most all of, of the big, big athlete agency firms and agents, whether they're independent or associated with the group, uh, are absolutely in that space, and the and one of the primary reasons they're in that space is because it allows them to have contact with the future clients that they otherwise could not have contact with 
from an agent standpoint with, with regards to representing them in their in their contracts, in their, mm-hmm. with the with the teams, with the clubs. Mm-hmm. Now, under the under the guise of name, image, and likeness, they can represent these players. You know, obviously forge a relationship with them, and then it's a natural feeding system. Of course, if a if an agent is representing a player from a name, image, and likeness perspective. And they built a a a, repu- a a relationship with them. Of course, they're going to represent them, you know, in two or three years when when they're drafted, and now they become professionalized. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's yeah. that's the way that's the way it's being done, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's it. That and if you're a student athlete and you're watching this, may I just highly advise that you have somebody that is at least a certified agent or a lawyer looking over your deals. I think there's a lot of shady people out there that don't know how to negotiate a basic contract and they're out there advertising themselves as being uh, a, a agreement experts. Right. Preferably both. I mean, I come, yeah. I come oh, down yeah. on the side of, of, you know, obviously I'm a lawyer, so I'm biased. But I, but I was an agent, you know, I was a certified agent before I was a lawyer. So I've practiced in that perspective. And, and, and I'm a firm believer in um, if it was my son, you know what I mean, that, that – that I'm looking for representation for, uh, I want that person to be a lawyer, right? I mean, it, I think, I think it's it's very important. That's a great piece of advice, though, to have somebody looking over your stuff, just in terms of how to navigate your career. Absolutely, and understanding the NCAA rules and, and how you how long you can play and where you should play and when you should figure out if you want to be, you know, draft eligible or, or play an extra year, you know? And or, a lot of students don't, re- don't really know how they can go about it. And so... Yeah, just navigating in life total because as agents, you know, you don't just become their, their whether it's a legal advisor or just an agent negotiating a contract, you're handling almost every aspect of their life. You know, the, the negotiation of the contract, right, of the, whether it's a playing contract or the marketing tra- contract, whether it's a contract with, you know, exploiting your name image lectures or the contract with the club, that's a very small part of what agents are actually doing. It's, it's a very small part. Mo- most of the time you're spending as an agent is just helping the client navigate their life, right? Negotiating a car deal, for crying out loud, a lease deal for a car, you know, you know, helping them find housing, you know, in the off season, you know yeah. what I mean? Helping them find housing in Arizona, in the Arizona Fall League or spring training, whatever it is. Did you, you have to I mean? figure all that stuff out on your own or was there like a, really? Well, my, when I was hired by my mentor, Michael Watkins, uh, who hired me, um, gave me an internship originally and then uh, hired me full time. I mean, he obviously cut my learning curve because, oh, yeah. you know, he, he, he taught showed me, you the he showed me the right way. But yeah, ultimately, you still have to, you're learning on your own as you, as you navigate through for sure. Yeah. That's crazy. You mentioned Deion Sanders. What do you, what do you, how do you, what do you think about the phenom as, as he would say it and pitch himself? <laughs> I think he has a better career as being a Tony Robbins than he does in well, I have, to this point, you know? I have mixed feelings on Dion and, and mixed feelings in the, in, in, in that, has he been good for the NCAA and for sure the University of Colorado, right? Yeah. From just a marketing perspective and excitement perspective, yes, I don't think there's an argument that he has not. But from a substantive perspective, from a substantive coaching perspective, from a winning perspective, and a winning, I think I think there's a there is somewhat a lot to be desired, right? I mean, there's a lack of of I think substance there from that standpoint. Uh, and so that's where I fall. But I think from, a mar- I mean, look, I don't really particularly like it. It's not my cup of tea, but yeah. it, to everybody uh, teach his own, right? I think that we're now in, in an age now where marketing and, and media and all that is really the primary driver now. Taylor Substance. And Travis all yes, day. Yes, absolutely. And so I think that's becoming the primary driver. And if you're looking to, to somebody like Dion, he drives that, he right? Does. Um, but if you're looking from a substantive coaching standpoint, I don't think he's, he wouldn't be my guy. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, look, I don't, I don't like the Shador Sanders holding up the watch and yeah. I don't, I don't really Pimpy. like that. I don't like that at all. It's just like, wait, wait, how many, how many, how much money are we going to bring in for marketing and not actual playing right you know you put yeah. together a team last minute that's gonna look like the bad news bears for a minute like it's you just got together everybody's right. there's no 
you know, synchronicity there just yet. You know, you got to, that's why people take months and years to, yeah. to figure it out. But yeah, it definitely disrupt the, uh, the, the MO for a minute. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it, it's almost like winning is not even the most important thing anymore. No, it's, 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 it's how many eyeballs absolutely. can you get watching the TV? Absolutely. And Dan Lanning, right. You know, famously the coach of, of Oregon right before the game, you know, when he's hyping up the team is in there talking about, you know, we make plays. We don't, you know, make, we're not here for the clicks, right? Or the, <laughs> right. That's famously. And they, he gave that motivational speech and Oregon goes out there and, yeah. and whoops yeah, them, yeah, right? Yeah. And that became the thing, right? Yeah. So I, I think you have a clash between there, right? Between, you know, the two worlds. And, and right? yeah, bringing um, out Lil Wayne right. and The Rock. And-, and going back to Jimbo Fisher, right, of Texas A&M, well, the rumored replacement right now for Jimbo Fisher is now is Deion Sanders. Really? Right? That's what the media is calling for, is for Deion to to take over that spot. Hey, right? you'll get eyeballs watching it for sure. I mean, I just, I like, I always find it funny with the, with the, you know, motivational speeches. I'm like, at what point are these no longer going to hit? Right. Because you, you just brought out your biggest hitters for the season. Who are you going to bring out next year? Yeah. They better all be presidents or world leaders because you're running out of options. It's going to gonna, it's gonna be interesting to see if the camera pans and see who's on the sidelines of the Washington State Colorado game this weekend, right? Yeah, I don't it's think, always. I don't think the Rock's going to be there. Nope. I, don't, I mean, now they're four and six, and <laughs> you know what I mean? And now they're, if they don't win out the next two games, they're not even bowl eligible. Yeah. Right? It is funny, though, to see his Instagram posts, his motivational, like, paragraphs long. You know, you got to put in the work. People aren't going to believe in you. And you're like, it's, it's, I love the confidence. I'm learning something about that. Like, you're four and six. No one gives a shit. I'm the best. I'm the best dude or woman in the game right now. Part part one of the big things that, from a personal perspective, right, um, is is I have from Dion's perspective, and you know he's a motivation. Like you said, he's a, yeah. in the Tony Robbins. You know, he should, it, he should sell videotapes or he's like audio that, tapes. Right? He's yeah. selling. You know, he's selling. You know, for lack of a the better dream. term, selling God. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's selling this religious, this you know, transformation of these young players, which I. The message is great, right? Agreed. The message is we want to we want to make these young men from this perspective, we want to make them better, right? I better agree. young men. And that yeah. should be the focus, right? Mm-hmm. And I agree with the messaging. The problem is the execution of what is going on it is not consistent with the messaging because if if his son is flashing his Rolex, right? And that becomes his his theme, right? That's his in flashing the Rolex to the fans. I don't. I don't understand the consistency and messaging between being a better young man and then Flash. going out there and flashing Rolexes and and you know money and and his Rolls Royce and all these things. That's your God, Ex- essentially. Yeah, essentially, that's the most important thing, right? Humility is not the most important thing. No, being you know, be, you know, being the best athlete and the best. But that that's not for me. Yeah. Right? Again, to eat, I'm a believer. To each his own, right? <laughs> yeah. Whatever floats to your each boat, his own. right? Whatever floats your boat, that's great. You yeah. know what I mean? But I just don't see the consistency in that messaging. Uh, and I don't really particularly, this doesn't float my boat. Yeah. This is not yeah. where I'm coming from. Mine either. The, right. the, the media spectacle of it all is just kind of like getting tired. Cause right. it's like, I get it on, I get it on Instagram. I get it on, you know, TikTok. I get it all literally all over the place on TV. Like I just don't want it anymore. Right. You know, if I want to. But it's weird because I have a 20 year old son, Right. And I'm, you know, I'm for, I'm 49. So I'm going to be 50 next year. I'm, I'm kind of in a weird place from a demographic standpoint, right? I'm, I got, you know, one foot in the old school type, you know, where I, how I was brought up, but at the same time, I've also been brought up in the internet age. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I'm not the social media guy, but a yeah. person, but I, I have, I have the other, you know, foot in that arena. Right. And it's hard for me to uh, really, analyze you know the situation as we were are now you know from that standpoint but i see these things and i think you know i i don't like that i don't appreciate it i don't like it but my 20 year old son you know who eats it up and his whole his whole group of friends and i do this constantly right i always i'm 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 i love the psychology right of my clients and the athletes that's what i really thrive on and i'll constantly engage his friends him and his friends and these and what they think about these things, right? And I, because I want to know, and they eat that up. They think this is the way, 
life is, right? It's all about clicks. Because that's all they know. That's all they know. That's it's all, all they about know. that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's about being an internet sensation, right? And and that's the the rap before, you know, of course the people want to be actors and entertainers too, but now we've added the element of being a social media star, right? And how that, and now of course, everybody has a microphone, everybody has a medium, right? There you go, right? <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, and so, you know, information is out there, right? And so it waters down a lot from the perspective, from that perspective, right? And, and I, and, but it's become part of, part of life and part of the business and that's what drives. You know? I think I'm right on the cusp of because I was in school at a time where computers just got introduced. Mm -hmm. So I I got to experience some life as a kid before right. the Internet or, or computers. And so like I'm right at the end. But yeah, I see it. it. But they don't they don't know a life without it. Right. And there is no life that seems possible or plausible without it in this right. day and age. It seems almost everybody has one or right. has a phone and everybody's on TikTok. And so. I think they've also been ingrained into just being glued to it and just being exposed to that kind of media all the time. I'll give you an example just dealing with the other day. So I represent a, uh, she's an, I guess she's an actress, but she's, she's been a social media personality in the hip hop world type thing, right? Um, and um, she has, um, she's transferred her image somewhat. I and, think I know who you're talking about. And, that. But I get a call from her uh, about a week or two ago. And, um, she, well, she sends me a, a text message first of all, and it's a, a link to a story and it's from, it's a story from the sun, which is a tab rag tabloid. Right. But here's the, 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 where our media is today, right? The sun, which is previously, or has always been traditionally, right. is the rag. Right. But then you have Yahoo news and you have all of the prevalent online news agencies. They pick up the story and they just run with the story. But, it's this person that is who's who's suing her for copyright infringement, um, which is total BS. Uh, and but she 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 did a story. The son did a story on her where she's alleging that my client put a curse on her, a curse, right? And that the and that um, as a result of the curse, you know, all of these things happened to her, right? absolute just total i mean it's not even in the realm of of reality the sun does a story on it and here it is on yahoo news and all over the internet no one wants to even bother to check their sources it, it it's absolute crap no one even calls sources anymore right i was i was mentioned in an article a couple years ago for something i had no involvement in and it said we reached out with no but like got no comment i was like no one gave me a fucking call I would have answered the phone. That that's, but that's like utterly false to just say we reached out and got no call back. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that at some point maybe somebody gets some ramifications coming their way for doing stuff like that. Because that's a, not only is that just bad journalism, that's a bad business practice for any studio to be allowing people to be operating right. their practice. And not only that, from a legal perspective, and when you're advising or or counseling clients, yeah. So what did you? Tell? What do you do? Right. What yeah. do you do on that? Right. And that's that's what she. You know, maybe she wants she wants to take action, but it's like, okay, right? What are you gonna do here? You gotta. There's two ways to go about this. If you continue to, um, you know, respond to these types of situations, it just fuels the whole thing, right? Um, is it better just to let it die, and it will die because we have a 24 hour news cycle? It's not even 24 hours anymore. It's a <laughs> one hour news hours, cycle for yeah. crying out loud, right? Um, you just let it die out. It's gonna die out, right? And and. That's always an issue of, of advising and counseling clients. And you almost don't want to fuel it either because then it'll get picked up again and then go through the same same cycle again. What, uh, what piece of advice do you give your clients if, say, the, the headlines start popping and Twitter starts blowing up and everything starts getting way out of hand? What would be your first piece of advice? Well, I think it really depends on what the issue is. Right. I mean, if it's a if it's a criminal issue, if we're advising from a criminal standpoint, then that's a different way you're going to navigate. Right. Because you have to be careful of of what the potential evidentiary you know, ramifications responding to these things might have. Right. I think you handle a, a criminal side much different than you're handling this kind of situation where, you know, it's it's just blatant falsehood. 
that, yeah, maybe there's a uh, potential cause of action for defamation or something like that. But at the end of the day, when you're analyzing, well, are we are you going to even get anything out of it, right? It's better just to let the story down. You handle those things two different ways. And then you also handle from, you know, where I've had a niche in the last probably 10 years, and that is representing professional athletes being retained by agencies and agents uh, because I occupy a really unique space for them um, where their clients are getting in trouble and have a potential criminal liability or there's an issue that arises where I'm now advising the client uh, from not only the criminal side, but also the potential ramifications that they may have on their playing side with regards to any oh, potential yeah. league ramifications Ooh. that might have. And that becomes really dicey, right? Because, you know, obviously from, from a legal standpoint, you know, the, the, the go-to is we're not making any comments and we're not making any statements, period. That's it. Law enforcement comes to your door, knocks on your door. You know, are you going to make a statement? We're not making a statement. No, we are not, right? There's only been a, there's only in my 17-year career uh, as a criminal defense attorney, there's only been two or three times I've ever voluntarily um, sat with a client to make a statement with the law enforcement. But the problem is from a player perspective in, the, in a professional athlete is what happens when the league comes to you mm. on that same situation, right? When the, when the league investigator comes to you and the, it's commissioner's office and they want you to cooperate because they're conducting an investigation now into whether you committed the domestic violence that you're being accused of, right? Yeah. Um, whether you were involved in that bar fight that, that you're being accused of, right? And they want a statement. Now, there's an issue there, right? Are those mm -hmm. statements that, that that player is making to the league office, are those potentially discoverable um, from law enforcement perspective or even from if there's civil litigation perspective? Are those discoverable issues that ultimately... Those I, statements are made. I would argue yes. Absolutely. MLB will absolutely put up every fight that they can to not, but because they need to keep their their practices private as well. But yeah, keep yeah. going. But where's the privilege there? There's no privilege no, that MLB has, no. right? So ultimately, from a law enforcement, law enforcement perspective, what's law enforcement going to do? Oh, you made statements to the commissioner's office? We're going to subpoena, subpoena those investigators. There's no privilege there. Right. And that becomes an issue. So if you don't cooperate for the commissioner's office, potentially mm -hmm. as an athlete, now you have just opened up your yourself for the ramifications from a suspension standpoint um, and exposure from the league standpoint. But at the end of the day, when you're weighing the two, right, yeah, you have criminal you exposure or you have league exposure as your criminal defense attorney. Uh, let's protect ourselves on the criminal front. Right. That's where I stand. Yeah. Um, so those are waters that we have to navigate through from, from that perspective. And, and then when you're talking to, as an yeah. added element, right, you have the agents, right? You have the agents <laughs> who are, you know, panicking and, you know, they're saying, well, we got to talk to, you know, I don't want, we can't get to have him be suspended or, you know, risk his contract. And almost terminated. everybody talks to the, to the league. Everybody's right. Almost always going to co cooperate. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're dealing with all of that. Which uh, brings up, we'll bring this up in a second because I, I asked my followers for questions that they would want to ask a criminal lawyer sports agent. So I got a wave of them, but one in particular is going to be very applicable to what we just talked about. I did want to talk about your background really quick on, on how you became a sports agent. So can you very quickly give a background of what made you decide that you wanted to represent athletes? So I was a baseball player my whole life. I wasn't very good. Right. But all my best friends that I played with at a high level were all really good. Right. Uh, real legitimate Division One prospects, um, major league prospects, stuff like that. Draft eligible potential. Mm -hmm. My best friend growing up um, was it uh, is still is a guy named Gabe Alvarez. And Gabe's former uh, assistant coach at USC, played in the major leagues with the Tigers and the Padres, is currently the double A manager for the Detroit Tigers uh, in their Erie team. Um, and he is a very well-respected baseball guy. He's my best friend. We grew up together. Well, when Gabe was going through the agent process, right, when he was at SC, he was an All-American at SC. He was one of the top-rated uh, college uh, baseball prospects going into the draft. I, he valued my opinion. I, he asked me to sit in on all of his agent pitch meetings. So I got to sit in on the meetings with the agents 
as they're pitching him to try to sign him. I got to sit on a number of them, right? And one of the uh, agents that was pitching him at the time uh, was Michael Watkins, who would be the, my mentor, who would, who, who would eventually hire me. And Michael, at the time, represented Aaron Boone. He represented Phil Nevin, Brett Boone, represented the Boone family, a number of, of different players. Um, and Michael offered me an internship. And of course he offered me an internship and we'd laugh you about were it the these BFF. days. I was the BFF, right? What Genius better way move. what better way to try to so sign smart. the player than to, than to hire the the best friend as the as the uh intern, right? Yeah. And and at the time Did um, you have an interest in in doing any of that? I once did. You I was my my uh intent was to go to law school after I graduated from oh, college. Okay. We were in college at the time, right? My intent was to go into law school and now this this opened the door for me, like sports and baseball. Of course, this is a natural fit. I want to do this. So he gave, he gave me an internship. I took it, right? Ultimately, there's a whole story about what happened. You know, it's a whole, you know, great story that I cannot tell. But, yeah, 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 that's but fine. But ultimately, Gabe didn't sign with, with, uh, with Michael, and he signed with um, Dan Lozano. Right of the Beverly Hills Sports Council at the time. I was going to say, would why be, does that name sound familiar? Because he was Albert. He's Albert Pujols. Oh, time. and I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. And um, and he wound up signing with with Lozo and then the Beverly Hills Sports Council. And um, Michael, during the time I was an internship for over about about a year, year and a half, I was in college. Well, I got to know all the young players, right? All the minor league players, all the next guys that were in line to be major league players at, at our at our firm. And I would do everything for them, right? And so as I got to know them, they started trusting me, right? They would come to me for everything instead of going to Michael, right? So when I graduated from college, also Michael smart. said, hey, instead of, you know, going to law school, I can, you don't need to be a lawyer to be an agent. I'm going to teach you everything. So I said, fine, let's do it, right? So I started. So I actually got certified as a baseball agent when I was 22 years old. I was the youngest a certified agent in Major League Baseball at the time. That's crazy. Yes. So I, and I was just, fre- yeah, I was just fresh out of college. Yeah, fresh out of college. And then, um, so I made the decision, you know, years down the line to, to go to law school at night and to become a lawyer because, you know, as I under- started to understand the business, I thought, you know, I, I, I need to get better, you know what I mean, and more knowledgeable. And I went to law school at night. And then uh, event, when I be, when a uh, few years into it, uh, Gabe actually you know, fired Lozano and came, and I represented Gabe towards the end, the last few years of his career, uh, and a number of those players. So that's how I became an agent, right? Um, and that I tell my students, right? That's really the number one way to become an agent is if you have, you know, a, if you can offer up a relationship with a current or future professional athlete in some way to the agent. That's how you're gonna. You're going to leverage that relationship to get that internship, to get that the, uh, interview and stuff like that. That's the number one way you become an agent. Which is why Mr. Sancho used the uh, brother there for you go. so many different There, avenues. There you go. That, that is the up. number one way. Because you know what? Agents, they want clients. Yeah. Right? They don't, they don't need another agent. Right? Mm-hmm. They don't need that. They need clients. Right? And so if you can provide them clients, they'll give you an opportunity. That's just the bottom, the bottom line. That's crazy, yeah. but good to know. And yes. always network, I guess, is a great piece Absolutely. of advice because you never know what opportunity is going to come your way with that, especially. No doubt. And, and don't be afraid if you're a young, aspiring agent, young, aspiring, really in anything you do, right? Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid to leverage your relationships and to, and to understand, to market yourself and to show your value. Right. And leveraging, I mean, in a good way, not yeah. in that, not yeah, in yeah, a, you yeah. know, a, yeah, a dirty, sleazy type, yeah. you know, thing. uh, what, what is the top quality you think would be needed f- for somebody to want to, for somebody to be a successful sports agent? Well, I, I see that from two perspectives, from a substantive standpoint, mm-hmm. um, obviously honesty and integrity. Right. From a substantive standpoint. Right. Because I think honesty and integrity, you know, veer into all aspects. Right. If you're an honest and you have integrity, that means you're doing the work. Right. Mm-hmm. You're 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 doing the work. Um, you're you're really working for your player uh, and you've studied your craft. Right. You're competent in what you're doing. Um, and How many times has an athlete asked you to not be honest or lead with integrity? I guess maybe not directly, but. 
It happens all the time, right? I think I've. G- yeah, give me, give it to me again. I gotta give it. This is the age story, yeah, right? I like this, these the age story. This agent, is my favorite agent. story. So, in, I'm a, I'm primarily, I was a baseball agent, right? Mm-hmm. So I, that's where the perspective I come from. Well, traditionally, as you well know, being in, you know, having a background, you know, where that your background with the club. Um, let's just say that Major League Baseball players don't have a reputation for being the most. Um, the being the best husbands in the world, right? That's just let's just say that faithfulness is is not you know it, it's it, it it's a you unique can say it for what it it's is. a unique quality in in a, in a in a major league baseball player, right? It's not it's not a rare quality for an athlete while in their professional career to be led astray. To stray, to stray, and 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 and. It's going to sound weird. No, it's say. not. Just say it. I'm in, so... in a lot of, I've been married for 23 years. Yeah. There's a caveat to this. Oh. 23 oh, years, okay. happily married. Yeah. Right. So, so I, um, the caveat to that is I, I, I can understand to a certain point why they find themselves in those positions. Right. Because it's not just, it's not just like they're not, they're out seeking it necessarily. You know, it's women are coming to them. Absolutely. Not just right. physically, but right. like DMs. Absolutely. And, and for those that have of, of us have been married, right? You know, you understand marriages. It's up and down, right? It's tough, right? You, you got to work on your marriage. And there are times where you and your spouse are fighting. You're not in a good place, mm-hmm. right? The difference between us mere mortals, right? And, and professional athletes is every day they have this constant temptation, right? That they're dealing with, right? Mm-hmm. Especially baseball players. And why I say especially baseball players is because baseball players are unique in a lot of ways because they're on the road so yeah. much. You play 162 games. So half of those games, for 81 of those games, you are on the road. Mm-hmm. You are traveling without your spouse, without your family. And so what happens when you get in an argument with your spouse and then your boys are like, hey, let's go down to the hotel bar and hang out and have some drinks. Yeah. And they're at the hotel Couple bar. Couple cute blondes at the bar. Absolutely. Absolutely. So from a certain perspective, I, I get it, right? I don't. Well, I, I'm, you know what I mean. <laughs> Just kidding. So, Not really. So I always pose, I always tell my law, you know, from the real world perspective, forget the legal perspective when I For tell sure. my students. For right? sure. I say, you know, you as the agent, you, uh, you get to, you, when you sign your player, right, when you become their agent, you, they come to you for everything. Above and beyond their parents, everybody. You're the you're really the closest person to them, right? Um, and they confide in you. You know what I mean. And 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 you know a lot of them, you know, open up to you. You know, and so um, you become that point person for them, right? For everything. And so what the problem with agents? And I I kind of learned this early on, and and it helped me in my career as an agent going forward. The problem with especially young agents is that they get into um, the business of running with the prof- their clients, right? Mm-hmm. Of trying to be that, you know what I mean? And running with them and trying to live that life, right? Uh, and so that's a problem, mm-hmm. right? And so what happens is you become intimately, you have an intimate knowledge, you know, to lack of a better term, of their relationships that they're having with women, yep. right? And all the things that are going on. Well, ultimately, when you are talking to your players about women and all the things that are going on, and it's ha ha, it's funny, and you know we're boys type, you know BS. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, that player is going to meet a woman, and he's going to marry her. Okay, and you as the agent, it quickly changes from you dealing with that player every day because that player's coming to you for everything. Now it transitions to you're dealing with his wife every day. Because the wife now becomes that point person and in a lot of ways replaces you doing a lot of things that you were doing for the player. Now the wife is doing. And the wife now comes to you, right? And you now establish this relationship with the wife now. Now you're tight with the wife. So I always say, what do you say when you get that phone call? And it's usually late at night. And you get that phone call and it's the wife. And she answers and she says, did you know? Did you know? And of course, what what do you what do what do, what do you mean? Did I know? I'm sorry, I'm in a bad area. I <laughs> cut out. Right? I, don't I, say to my co- I don't know. What do you say? I don't know. Right? What do you say? What are you because- talking about? <laughs> right. What would you say? Right? Did you know? Because obviously, you can't say, "Well, yeah, I did." Right? Yeah. Because ultimately, how many and you being having your background as general counsel, right? 
How many players did you ever know or hear of that got a divorce while they were athletes, while they were their career was? Doesn't none, uh, none unless their their professional sports career was about to take a massive hit. Absolutely, right? It's very so, rare, right? Very rare. So usually the divorces happen within, within, in my experience, and this is strictly anecdotal, right? Yeah, yeah, Three yeah. Three to yeah. five years post-career, right? It was when, they, when they've retired. That's when the divorces are happening because all the mm -hmm. little things that the wife is overlooking uh -huh. because you're still Money. living the life and all of that, the life, Wears off right in the worst first couple of years. Now you're dealing with this person who is here every day now, not on the road, right? Not traveling, not with the team. Yeah. Every day is at home. And for the most part, it's <laughs> struggling to transition to real life, mm -hmm. right? It's a struggle for these athletes to transition into real life from a professional career. And now they're really becoming a real everyday normal person, right? It's a struggle all the way around. So divorces are prevalent in that period of time. But- during that period, during the period of the careers, right, you, the wife asks you, as you know, right? And you can't say no because you represent your client yeah. at the end of the day. You know, you have a fiduciary duty to your client, right, as both a non-lawyer agent and, of course, I hire fiduciary responsibility to your client as a lawyer, yeah. right? So obviously, theoretically, you cannot expose your client and say, yeah, I did know and blah, 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 right? And you can't, and if you say no, like I said, going back to, they never get divorced during their career. Ultimately, they're going to stay together, okay, at least for the period of their career. And ultimately, now the wife doesn't trust you. Because the player's going to... Because she knows that you covered it up and you lied and you knew and you didn't... Because he's going to be apologetic and come clean and... He, and come now forward. he's going to appease, right? Mm -hmm. Now he's going to do everything he can to appease the wife. What do you think the wife's first thing she's going to want to do is? Fire Fire you. him. Right, it's a, it's, a, it's a real life. Conundrum. So, what do you say now to kind of either prevent that from happening or get around that issue? If and, you and me, not now, me, not now. Let me, then, let me get back. To, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, not so. every player, right? I, I'm just saying there's a there's a, a lot of players. I don't want to. I don't think we're going to be broadly. facing a defamation <laughs> lawsuit for for presuming that athletes I, can be I, philanderers. I had a number of and in fact, great. I'm okay with that on my page because. I have seen so many instances. It's so funny though. There's a there's a specific group of people on TikTok or women all that that specifically seek out athletes. And I'm like, I honestly I think you might be the dumbest species of human I've ever met in my entire life because it is it is a quick quick path to sadness for you. Because it like you're chasing a somebody that will always be kind of questionable in terms of of those kinds of guidelines but yeah once their professional career ends they become different people yes. they're no longer the superstars that they're living in and it becomes a different life so yes. maybe seek out somebody who isn't you know i'll tell you a couple of clients that i know on an offhand that i would absolutely aaron boone who's a former client of mine, okay, cool, manager yeah. of the of the new york yankees today right phenomenal guy love respect him I think he's a great guy. Um, Jeff Conine, uh, longtime Mr. Marlin, um, phenomenal human being. Yeah. Two, two, in my opinion, superior human beings um, that I just love and respect to the tilt, right? Those guys are great. Um, and so um, they're special people, though. Mm -hmm. right? I think they're just special people mm -hmm. out there. And I think Aaron Boone from Aaron Boone's who takes so much heat obviously because he's the manager of the New York Yankees and yeah. it's the New York Yankees. It goes with the job. Right? Yeah. It is what it is. I think he's uniquely qualified to be the manager of the Yankees because um, of, of, I think, the quality of character that he is. Speaking of the Yankees, we're going to talk about the, the Stanton. Did you hear about the comments that the Yankees made against no. Stanton? Wait. In his – because he's now a free agent, right? He's about to be free. Is he he's a free not agent now? I in, didn't realize. And – the Yankees made a statement on um, he keeps getting injured. They essentially said he keeps getting injured. And they said that right as he's about to go seek out other deals, what would you do as the agent for somebody like Stanton when a team's coming after you as you're about to enter free agency about that? Do you – is that a conversation that you have with the team? Do team? You I wouldn't be happy about it. That's for darn sure. I wouldn't be happy about it. No doubt about it. The other, the flip side of that is we all, everybody knows he's been in, he's been injured yeah. this whole time, yes. right? The issue is though, is 
is are those comments related to his past injuries or are those comments really geared to whether he's damaged goods mm -hmm. now going forward? Because that's a real issue, right? If the Yankees are making comments about his current and future medical diagnosis, that's a real issue, right? In all different kinds of ways, right? And so that, that's something as an agent that absolutely, uh, and as a lawyer, right, yeah. that I'm taking a hard look at. If the comments are reflected as to what happened in the past and he had an injury, you know, we're, we're looking, you know, we're looking to move into a different direction. That's something different. But absolutely. I think if it's something that 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 reflects a, you absolutely do. But that once again. And if I'm general counsel of the New York Yankees, I'm a little how much nervous. You wanna, how much you want to bet none of those statements got cleared through legal. Oh, no. They never do. No. They always, it's always after. And everybody's like, where's the lawyer? And you're like, I was right here. No one sent me this information because they know it's going to get held up and, or they probably wouldn't be able to say it. Right. Which is insane. So, anyway, what yeah. were we talking about before? Sorry. Oh, uh, the agent, the, the, oh, there yeah. were a couple yeah. of good guys. Yeah. There's a number a couple of good, good guys. Ones. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I want to make sure that we, but I'm just saying, That's it's, fair. it's definitely with the young, younger crowd, you know, and, Players have a tendency to obviously slow down as they, yeah, I think as they I live just, the life. I think I just, I think I got jaded so early because right. I've had so many heroes as baseball players. And when you find out that they're absolute pigs, I just get, I, it's kind of just in the back of, like ones that I really looked up to and you're like, oh, they've got a, a chick in each city. Cool. Like yeah. these were people that everybody looks up to and so that was part of the problem when i became an agent i i stopped being a baseball fan and i started rooting for the people i knew were good guys likewise you know and, and i ceased becoming and i didn't become a baseball fan again until my youngest son who's a i was a, i grew up a, a cubs fan um i was a dodger fan then i became a cubs fan but i stopped becoming a fan of baseball and when i stopped being an agent and stopped representing players i kind of just kind of got away from the game a lot, you know what I mean? And then within about three or four out, three or four years, um, my son, my youngest son, who was a big Dodger fan and becoming a real baseball fan, mm -hmm. um, kind of got me back into being a fan and I became a Dodger fan because of my youngest son again. Oh, and yeah. And so now I'm, being, I'm, a, oh, I'm a fan again because I don't really know any of the players anymore from a personal standpoint. Yeah. Now they're all managers. They're all old now, right? I know yes. those people. But, but from the current players, I don't really know, know them from a personal standpoint. So now it's just all... But yeah, you 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 you're jaded, right? And yeah, bit, yeah. yeah it, it becomes tough. Still the Dodger veil, fan. The curtain Still is, a Dodger fan. The curtain is opened up. It, yes. Yeah, and yeah. I yeah, it's it does take the fun out of it a little bit when you see the ugly side of the business. You're like, damn, I yeah. can't just go to a game and just enjoy the game anymore. I have all of these other things you got to think about. And when you do talk about stuff like sign stealing or misconduct or sexual harassment or domestic violence amongst players or teams and just like all of this stuff. And you're like, well, that it's not just going to a game and getting a hot dog no. anymore. And you sex, drugs and rock and roll and sex, professional sports drugs is and baseball is the real deal. Yes. Uh, you were, why were you a Cubs fan before? So it all just because back when WGN was the, was the super station and it was it, when I was a kid, the Cubs didn't have lights at Wrigley Field, so um, they played all their games during the day. Well, in the summer, I was home all day. Oh, and that's so why they played all their games yeah. during the day? Yes. I they, did not know Wrigley that. Wrigley Field didn't get lights until, I don't even know what it was. That's mid crazy. Mid-90s, I think. Yeah, mid early to mid-90s. Um, yeah, so Wrigley Field had no lights, so they played all their day games. So uh. I was home in the summer, baseball fan. I just started watching Cubs games because they were on during the day. There's nothing else on. And Ryan Sandberg, who is being a great guy. Yeah, tell me. And crazy stories. Well, yeah. I don't, I'm not going to tell the story. I, wasn't, I don't have for sense of the story I was alluding to, but uh, it's all over the internet. But, but um, Ryan Sandberg was my idol. He was the second baseman. He was my idol. I loved and adored him. He was the guy. And when I was 12 years old, um, my mom, I grew up in a rough neighborhood. Um, my mom, God rest her soul, is the greatest person I've ever had in my life. And she was a big believer on, you know, teaching me lessons about you can do whatever you want. Don't let, don't limit yourself. Don't let anybody tell you what you can or can't do. Right. She was big into that. And when I, when I was my, for my 12th birthday, I just made the little league all-star team. Right. And I was hanging out and my mom asked me, you know, what I wanted for my birthday. Right. And I said, well, I want to meet Ryan Samberg. And she's like, okay, I'm going to make that happen. 
And I'm like, okay, mom, sure, right? And this is back in 86, 1986. So this is pre, you know, the state of affairs now and everything was different back then, right? I sound like an old, old, old man, right? Yeah, you're not that old. back then, right? (laughs) But so in 86, so she says, okay, I'm going to make that happen. I said, all right. So the Cubs had been coming into town to play the Dodgers. And I'm going to, I don't remember the time frame, but it was like a week or two, Mm -hmm. you know, later on after I had this conversation with my mother. And so she says, all right, um, I'm going to call the, the, the Dodgers, right? It was, it was about three days before the Cubs were coming in town. She said, I'm going to call down there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get the number to, to, to talk to Ryan. So I'm like, oh, right. How is that going to happen, right? So she, my mom calls Dodgers, just calls the normal general number, right? She talks to somebody okay. before automation, yeah. right? Before you yeah. had to press one and you're never going to speak to it. Before you could get a hold she of it. She calls, anyway. some secretary answers the phone, and my mom says, hey, my name is Jerry Sanchez, and... And uh, my son wants to meet Ryan Sandberg, who plays on the Cubs. I was sitting there. For, I listened. He w- plays for the Cubs, and uh, you know he's a good boy. And I, he wants to meet him, and and I want to see if I can make this happen. And so the secretary says, "Well, hold on, I, you know, I'll, I'm gonna transfer you to so and so, right?" So she, she gets transferred to somebody else, and she gives the same spiel. I said, "Jerry Sanchez, and you know, my 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 son want I want to have my son meet Ryan Sandberg, and she's like, "Well, okay," and they transfer to somebody else, right? Finally, she gets to somebody and they tell her, well, the Cubs are coming in town in three days and they stay at, uh, the, uh, she gives, they give them the, her the name of the hotel they stay at. So <laughs> mom says, okay, great. So she waits three days, right? She waits, Cubs come in town, she calls the hotel, right? And she says, I want to speak to uh, Ryan Samberg. Is Ryan Samberg in, right? I love the and, effort. And, and the, I love and, the and effort. And of course, Ryan Samberg is under an alias, of course, right? And, and the, the, um, the hotel person the, says, well, we know? don't have anybody named Ryan Samberg. And my mom looks at me and says, who's the manager? <laughs> and so I give her the manager's name. And I, believe, I think it was Lee Elia so at the time, smart. right? Yeah. And I said, Lee Elia, right? And she's like, can I speak to Lee Elia, right? And and she and, and the, the 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 front desk says, "Yes, please hold." <laughs> so so easy. she leaves a message on the manager's hotel room. This is Jerry Sanchez. My son, what you know, I the love whole spiel, right? So I'm I leave. Right? I'm going to go play with my friends. Right? We're going to hang out. And my mom's like, "You shouldn't leave in case Ryan Sandberg calls." I'm like, "Yeah, okay." So I roll out. <laughs> As God is my witness, sh- I shit you not, I come home later on, right? And my mom says, I told you you shouldn't have left. And I'm like, what? She says, about 45 minutes ago, Ryan Sandberg called and I just spoke to him. I'm like, <gasps> come on, mom. You're she's lying. Like, she's like, he told us to come to the game, to come to the hotel tomorrow night after the game. And I'm like, no. And she's like, yes. So... Next day, we, we, we watched the game, and about the fifth or sixth inning, my mom was like, hey, let's go. So we jump into our little truck, and me and my best friend and my mom, we go to the hotel. And we're sitting there, and we're waiting, and all the players start coming into the hotel. It's Sean Dunstan and um, a lot of players, and they're, I'm having my ball, I'm signing a ball, and then there's just you know Ed Lynch, who would become a general manager who – wouldn't sign my ball and I became a lynch hater hater. Um and then hater. I see I see who do I see roll up? I see Harry Carey roll up, right? And Harry Carey waddles in, you know, and I'm like, Mr. Carey, Mr. Carey, can you sign my ball? He's like, sure, son. And he signs Holy Cow, Harry Carey signs my ball. And uh got to meet Harry Carey. And but all the players show up, no Ryan Samber. Right? We're just waiting there. My mom's like, just be patient, just be patient. No Ryan Samber. And all of a sudden, it's like a movie, right? All I'm looking, I'm sitting down, and the doors open up. And here's Ryan. I could see it in my mind, right? Ryan Sandberg walks through, and I'll never remember. He's wearing these jeans and, a, and like a plaid shirt, mm-hmm. and he's got a box under his arm, and he walks in. And he's walking, and he see, he's looking at us, right? And we're sitting down on the couch. I'm looking at him. And he's looking. He's walking up, and he locks eyes. It's like a, it's like a romance, right? We lock eyes, and he yeah. walks up, and he's like, are you JD? And I said, yeah, yes, I am. I say, hey, Mr. Sandberg. And he's like, oh. hey, JD, nice to meet you. I've heard a lot of great things about you. You know what I mean? And this, this is your mom. And yeah, I told you, Mrs. Sanchez, how are you doing? We spoke yesterday and just couldn't have been the nicest. Not, I mean, just and, and for 15 minutes, signed all my stuff and would just talk to us, right? And then my mom says, that's enough. 
Thank you, Mr. Sandberg, for your time. I really appreciate it for you giving my son our, our time. And we and you know, thank you so much. And he said, hey, good luck, son, you know, and good luck in the All-Stars. I know you're playing in the All-Star game here pretty soon. I said, thank you, Mr. Sandberg. And we rolled on off. I right? love that story so much. Yes. And so much. My hero lived up. I love that I your mom was like, okay, that's very, enough time for him to. And, and my mom said, no, it's enough time, you know. Very rarely when you meet your heroes, right? Do they live? He, Ryan Sandberg lived up to my hero status. That's amazing. Yes, yes, that's my little Ryan Sandberg story. Oh, I love that story. Yes. I love that story so much. And 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 that can't be. That would never be to happen in this day and age. Sorry. No, not gonna happen. No, I've actually seen a lot of athletes. Well, I mean, almost to give them some credit about it there there's so many scalpers with autographs now that take advantage absolutely and they'll send in kids send in the kids absolutely and so now like some people i've seen like on tiktok or instagram some people get a bad rap because they're refusing to sign photos but what right. they don't realize is is those athletes know those people or absolutely. those scalpers or those children and are refusing because they don't want their stuff just sold they will you and, know. and not only that but i've been around I'm constantly right with players after the games and stuff like that you see the autograph hounds come up and they have this book. They have and they're book. switching through all and these the, photographs, getting to the whoever your yeah. player is right. There. Oh, can you sign these? And or they send the little kid up with a pristine major league ball with the right Sharpie, right? And they're and, like, wait and, a minute. And there's a difference between that and going a kid going up with a dirty little league ball. Yeah. Or their, you know, their jacked up baseball card, right? And having the player. There's a difference in that because you know it's authentic, right? It's a little kid come versus the pristine lithograph. You know what I mean? With a Sharpie or this ball or, or this helmet or whatever it is that they're they're signing, you know, like, hey, wait a minute. This is this is for resale value and this is this is a this is a thing. I thought of a funny story as we were talking about philanderers. <laughs> so <laughs> so two things. There's a there's an amazing book about the old uh, eighty six Mets, eighty seven Mets team that was World Series team that was famous for these antics. Kevin Alster, um, Kevin Mitchell. Where, I mean, it works. where they talk about the sending the ball boy, sending the ball boy up to the stands to get the girl. And there's a story in there about Kevin Alster having sex with women that they had pulled out of the stands in the clubhouse during the game. Oh, yes. My. It's a, there's a book. I forgot the name of the book. I um, wonder the, the I wonder what wife the... swapping on the plane <gasps> between the players and the wives. What book is this? Uh, it, it's it's about the 86 Mets. I think it's dr called Dream Team, I think. Okay, I'm going to have to watch it. It's about the 86 Mets okay. and about them just doing piles of cocaine on the plane, coming back and wife swapping on the plane after they won the World Series. Yes, it's it's a phenomenal. You, you got it. That's insane. Yeah, I, I, if I remember is it the book team. or a, it's a book. Yeah, okay, it's a book that was written. It. Yes. Oh my god! And the players come out and and they 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 were interviewed and stuff like that. And it's it's widely well known. You know what I mean? Uh, widely. And there's a story. I think of the story. If I'm not messing my stories up, Kevin Mitchell, um, strangling a cat. I if I remember because he was pissed off with his girlfriend. I mean, oh, there, I there, like, it's so all he was kinds on of drugs. All kinds of different type of things. Yeah, but this is the wild age. How much of that do you think was tied to to steroids? Or Anna. So I think I told you this, or I told when you were a student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the, people ask me, you know, what are the what are the things that stick out to you when you're your baseball agent days? And and again, again, I haven't been a practicing sports agent since two, early, well, 2010, 2010, something like that, uh, 2008. Um, so it's been a long time. So I'm not intimately, I don't have any intimate knowledge really of what goes as now. much as going on now. But back when I'm my agent days, is I was an agent in the heyday of the steroid era. Right. That's that's where I that's how I where I came up through my big my biggest thing is biggest accomplishment that I saw from a major league baseball perspective is no player ever dropped dead on a baseball field from the amount of, of substances that were in their body. Right. So the age people call it beaning up. Right. Beaning up is just taking amphetamine before the game. And they talked called it used to call it greenies. And it was just a little green pill. And the players would get it from Mexico, and greenies were just it essentially like Adderall. It's part amphetamine, part speed. Okay. Okay. Oh. All okay. right. Part part amphetamine. I still part... don't fully understand the difference of each, but go right. ahead. Right. And they were just in little green capsules, and they called called it greenies, and they would call it beaning up, right? Bean up before the game. They look like did little they, green did beans. Did they get it, or did they have like a no? Clubhouse they had people get it. people got people it. Go people it. people got it. Whether it's a clubhouse, who we'll people say people got people it. People got it, right? And and they were just having these baggies, right? 
And and Greenies and, and all of that, beaning up had been around since the 60s and 70s. It's not anything. So players play 162 games a year, play every night. And they're playing injured. And they're so they're it's tough to get up for the game. So you bean up, get up for the game, right? So now you're on some speed. Before the game, you're on an upper, right? You play the game, right? Well, you, not these players weren't playing natural, right? For the most, well, not every player, of course, but, yeah. but a lot of players were already ingesting anabolic steroids, right? And human growth hormone, testosterone, all the different performance enhancing substances that players are using in the off season and sometimes during the season, depending on their cycles, right? So they're already ingesting all of that. And then they're beaning up with amphetamine. And then after the game, you know, you got to come back down. So whether it's alcohol, marijuana, whatever the downer is now that they're taking in, they're on this continual cycle throughout the whole entire year, right? And, I mean, the amount of players that had substance abuse issues. Still oh, probably. Still probably, I'd imagine, right? And, and then it, that goes, you know, hand in hand with the pressure that they're under, the anxiety, you know, they may... You know, the pressure of maintaining their jobs and, and, and performing and all of that is all, it all goes all hand in hand. All intertwined. Yeah. And so that, that, that was always a, a huge issue. And, and that no player dropped dead or, or died as a, as a direct causal relationship between that is, is to me something, something pretty. I will never forget it. The statement that you made about the most physically demanding and tiring yes. sport on a body and on an athlete is in baseball because of the 162 game play and always being on the road. So if you, if you look at some of the interviews, Bo Jackson, Deion Sanders, again, Brian Jordan, who's a former two sport athlete, the interviews that they gave and they were asked, what is the most physically demanding sport? Cause they both played baseball and football. Every single one of them said without question, it's baseball without question, because they're playing every single day. As a football player, you get hurt. You can not play during the week, and you can treat throughout the entire week. And then you can play on Sunday, right? And then you get shot off with cortisone, whatever it is. You can perform for that three-hour period, right? But baseball players are playing every single night. Those guys don't want to go on the DL, right? They don't want to go on the disabled list. So they're playing injured. And when you get injured at the beginning of the season, you never have time to recuperate because you can never take time off because you're playing every day. So you're playing injured biomechanically as we know our bodies if you injure your left knee and you continue to perform ultimately the right side your right knee is going to go out at some point right because of overcompensation simple simple biomechanics right um so these players are playing their bodies are ravaged not to mention all the stuff that they're putting in their body now you add the element of any kind of pain medication pain management right whether whether they're taking for that right and and they're using that for excuse me, for pain management, but then that becomes, of course, drugs of abuse that are just added on top because of the issues, obviously, that the pain medication becomes, right? So, the, it's, it's a, and so all of them had said, they're without question, baseball is the more physically demanding sport. Yeah, you might have the more catastrophic injury in football. Or head sure. injury. That, exactly. But... And this is before, the obviously, the CTE thing, which is obviously a whole other issue, right? So um, sad. So sad, Dude, right? What's his name? Antonio... Antonio Brown? No, no, no. Who's the one that was just arrested for potentially murdering his mother? Oh. That was found oh, in Mexico. Oh, I did see that. Was it Antonio I Jones? I don't remember what player it was. He was found in Mexico, and then yes. he was like, he's clearly not okay. Yes. Um, and he was talking about, like, yes. they're cut. And then he was do. on the plane getting transported and flipping out. Right. Um, Sergio, Sergio Brown. Sergio Brown. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. CTE, I, I mean, it's the, a... I mean the 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 evidence we talk about this in our it's sports there. class. The evidence from is coming out of Boston Medical Center with Dr. Ann McKee, who is uh, on the forefront of all of this, is is just astonishing, mm -hmm. right? I think I think it's I think it was ninety two percent of the brains that have been tested today, by, uh, that's coming out of Boston Medical Center, um, had tested positive for CTE. 92% of the brains of NFL players that have been tested. My uncle, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, is a brain doctor. He originally, he conducted the first largest NFL study of concussions and CTEs of players in the NFL. And his findings, because he does brain spec imaging, mm -hmm. insane. Like just Crazy. the amount of small impact on a head injury, the long-term damage that it causes to somebody's brain really unless 
people don't believe it until they look at it. Like they look yeah. at the brain scan themselves, and, and they, they can go only test it at postmortem after mm-hmm. they after the person dies. Mm-hmm. It's the only it's the only way they can really test. Here's the other thing: it, 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 above and beyond just that major catastrophic injury are what they call the post concussive injuries, which are just the small little hits, normal everyday hits that a player takes during practice. That you, there's no injury associated with it, but it's these con- repeated hits to the head that have a cumulative damage that, that accumulates, right? And, and again, we've talked, I'm a firm believer in, in I believe, I'm a teach his own guy. I've said this a couple of times, yeah. right? Whatever floats your boat, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, um, you know, you make a personal decision, you make the personal decision, right? Um, and and I, I, I always shudder when I think about it because I'm like, don't be so, so judgmental. I don't like judgment. Don't be so judgmental. When I see the, you know, the little Pop Warner and the and the parents with Pop Warner kids, and I'm like, man, how could they how how could they expose their children to this? My Why guess would is anybody... that they're not educated. Yeah, my but... guess is that or they don't care. Because... Right. Why would anybody potentially expose the most precious thing there is in life to you to potential injury? I wouldn't I just I can't do I can't get my head there. When you look at that, this is a big topic in my sports law class, right? And you look Football is a gladiator sport. It really it's is. a gladiator sport, right? There's only so much that those protective helmets are going to do and protect each other, right? I mean, and I, I'm a football fan. Yeah, I me love too. football, right? I love football, and and I've always loved football. And when I think, you know, I always think, well, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer, and and you, you know, you you support where you put your dollars. You you're supporting whatever that is, right? Yeah. I mean, and you sit back and you're like. How good do you feel? I feel like knowing that these guys for entertainment and for your entertainment purposes are putting their lives on the line and that these guys are going to be affected long term for that. And I'm like, that's a rough one, right? Yeah, I feel like I would feel a lot better about it if I knew that the leagues did something a little bit more uh, either on the proactive front or on the back end when they are no longer at a professional level to take care of them. And that's where I have the problem is knowing that once they're no longer professionally playing, they just, they're they done. Be, they become disposable Every and an year. afterthought. Every year there's new players coming through. And it's Every really, year. yep. And, and, and it's really sad. Yeah. The average, you know, NFL career is 3.2 years. You know what I mean? And, you know, and, 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 that's a short, short window, you know, and people really is these guys don't understand that you have the rest of your life. You know, you're, you're, you're engaging and embarking upon a new life and career. If you're lucky enough to get to the NFL and put all your eggs in that basket, you know, at the tender age of 25, 26 years old, you know, it's, and then, you know, you have the long-term damage. And I think the medical evidence is, it's all, it's there. It seems like it's irrefutable. It's there. You know what I mean? And like I said, I'm a, I'm a huge high school football guy now because my sons go to St. John Bosco. And, of course, St. John Bosco's a powerhouse, and I'll be going to the CIF game tonight and stuff nice. like that. So I, I follow the Bosco football yeah. team. My boys were wrestlers, and, and my oldest was a baseball player too. But, um, but um, I've, I'm a big follower of St. John Bosco football, and I, and I think the level of football that's played at that level is different. They're playing for scholarships and futures and everything like that. But uh, even high school football, like, damn. I didn't play high school football. I was a baseball player, but – even when you look at that, I'm like, God, even even the potential exposure, you know, a young high school football, you never thought of, you know what I mean? You don't think of those things. You know, now we know that the potential impacts, you know, we're at the infancy stages of all of this. Yeah, you know? when when I think I was telling you when I was watching quarterback on Netflix and they had the un with they had the hits that were filmed without the music, you can actually hear the hits, the impact. And like to think about how it was in real life is just it's and, heavy hitters. And I, as you all know, I officed for many, for a number of years with Athletes First. We shared offices. Athletes First is one of the, the biggest, I believe, now NFL football agency in the NFL. And so I would see these guys come in all the time to the office, the football player, NFL guys. And, you know, these guys are gigantic. They are humongous. Big boys. Big boys that are fast. And they are, you know, peak athletes. And they know how to throw their weight around. And they know how to, you know, engage everything to the fullest yep. extent and maximum possible damage. I can't Im- There are players that I, that rolled to that I, I'm like, I can't imagine him hitting me. No. Like, he could kill you. You know what I mean? Literally. Humongous. You know what I mean? Humongous. 
I would be dead. Behemoths. Yeah. would be dead. Behemoths. You know what I mean? And and so I I have some knowledge of that. You know what I mean? Just going back to baseball really quick. Do you think you foresee, do you ever foresee a world where Major League Baseball decides to cut their season length less than 162 days or games? I, I, I find it hard to believe. I think the revenue is, you know, the cut in revenue I don't think is something that anybody wants to see from their it's standpoint. It's insane, though. It's a lot of games. It's a lot it's of a games. a lot of games. Yep. I, I wonder don't, what it I would take. I, I wonder what that. it would take. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I wonder what it would take. And I, I, again, I don't know the state of what the game – I'm assuming it can't be much different than it used to be. You know what I mean? And I know there's – more testing and stuff like that, but as you, as we well know, the more testing is, the more the more incentive about it drug is. Drug testing, yeah, drug yeah. testing. The more incentive it is, incentivize it is for people that are going to be smart and develop systems to to you know not. Did you hear about the UFC pulling out or essentially uh, parting ways with USADA? Yep, I did. Which, which is what? Tell me. They lost all credibility with me when they let Brock Lesnar go through when no one questioned him in the slightest. And I was but like, we well, see wait the- a minute. Wait a minute. Right. Absolutely. I love Brock Lesnar. Do not get me wrong. I am obsessed with that man. However, I think we would all be smoking crack if we didn't acknowledge that that guy is taking something right. somewhere and that. They didn't give him. They didn't give him an ex, like an exemption. Right. For some of these rules, like come on. And I'm not. I'm not. I'm by far away not conspiracy guy. That's not. That's not how I roll. Right. I'm, I guess it I'm depends. A, I'm a, people come with the the conspiracy. And I'm like, well, there, there's a simple, you know, you know, explanation. For it. But but putting that aside, but look at Conor McGregor, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, he gets injured, right? And, you know, he's no longer in the testing protocol. He's out because he's injured. Yeah. And you see him working out, and he is huge. Now, he's a 33, 34-year-old man who looks to put on, and I know he's a professional athlete, looks to put on 15, 20, 25 pounds of muscle yeah. in a short amount of time. That's not possible, right? Any, any, it's just not possible to put on that amount of muscle on an adult male at the in his mid early to mid thirties in that shorter period of time without the help of something. Right. Um, but you know, now he's coming back. You look at, this is all completely anecdotal by the way. Right. I'm um, speaking as a fan, I have no intimate knowledge of any of this, but then you look at him now as he's going to start coming back and now look at him and he's lost weight. You know what I mean? And he's a different you look at the body specimens, and like I said, anecdotally, you can at least, say, especially if you've been in this business long enough, you right. have an idea. Right. I feel like they've been wanting to find an excuse. To, Absolutely. To pull their testing in house, which is so. And I'm I surprised mean, Dana White has let it for so long. I see Dana White as as the guy that's going. I don't care. There's whatever nothing. No, I I'd rather have them on and show these even more. Crazy At this specimens. point, let's just make it. Let's just bring it back to Gladiator Day. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. if we're gonna let some and not the others, that's what I mean with like some of these other ones. Like, if you're gonna, if everybody's just gonna do it in secret, then let's just let everybody do it and go. I got some it. Some people might not agree I've with been that, a, but I've been a constant conversation with my son, my oldest son, right now because he's he's a wrestler, right, in, in high school wrestler, and now he's a beginning jujitsu guy, right? He's 20 years old. He, this is what he does, right? Um, and, uh, and we have a great relationship and we talk constantly. We're always talking about stuff. He lives at home with us still. He's going to school, goes to college. He's a jujitsu guy now. And we're talking about, oh, what's his name? The big jujitsu guy out there. And he's on steroids. Uh, in UFC? He's not. He trains. And, and uh, he's he just, he's a real jujitsu guy. He's not a UFC guy. He's a oh. jujitsu guy. Uh, he's like the, uh-huh. no, he's like the number one jujitsu guy. But he's a steroid guy. He's a self-admitted steroid guy, I and so we talked about that, and I talked to my son about that because my son's a big workout guy. You know, mm-hmm. he does all the whole thing. So we're all constantly talking about these things. It's, oh, what's his name? He's got a beard, white beard now. Is this him? Gordon, Gordon, yeah, Gordon, Gordon uh, Ryan. Gordon Ryan, right? So Gordon Ryan, I think, is is, is upfront about his steroid use, right? And he's the number one jujitsu. And I'm, I tell my son, like, well, I don't know. I, how do you feel? My, I, my, how do you feel about that? And he's like, well. You know, as long if everybody if everybody knows and everybody's uh, competing on the same level and, and on the thing, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it. I'm like, well, I, I kind of see your point there, right? But you know, baseball is one thing because I kind of had that. 
I, my whole thing was back in the steroid days when steroid era when I was an agent. Everybody asked, well, about steroids after the Jose Canseco kind of mm -hmm. thing came out, right? I always said, well, you know, most of them are on steroids. So in essence, it was kind of an equal playing field, right? For the most part, you know what I mean? Anecdotally, of course. Um, it seemed like it was an equal playing field, so it kind of is what it was, right? But that's different than actual fighting and, and you know what I mean? Contact, and, and contact like, like combat that. Sports. That seems a little different, it right? It really does, especially when you... it uh, Exactly. It seems a little different to me on a different level. But I, I always thought, you know, Dana White is he's going to want to juice these guys up and throw them out there and let them just kill each other. Somebody dying in the UFC ring, I think, for Dana White is... It's good PR. It's good PR. Any, any it, PR is good PR for interest. them, and he does not... Yeah, it adds more interest to the game. Yeah. And the UFC, WWE, William Morris part, like, all of it just seem, just screams... I agree. That's why I said I don't... Antitrust shit guy. for me, right, and right. I hate it, and right. I don't want it, and I don't think that they should have been allowed... To all merge companies like that, uh, everything's just going to be fixed. Especially in this day and age, where everything's a conspiracy, too. By the way, I mean now you're really lending, leaning into that, right? Now you're really, you know. Well, I mean, it's already kind of with boxing so heavily. I mean, I, it's not a conspiracy. I think it's a very logical, reasonable belief that a lot, a lot of these things are fixed, made, right? You know, and so, and I think it's. It's probably one of the easiest sports for you to be able to manipulate because it's an individual, not just like a team or a coach or, you know, it's one. UFC is really easy because how hard is it to, to, to get, in a a or get in a grappling move and let yep. the other guy get advantage and get you in an arm bar or chokehold? And it all looks absolutely you legit. Watch, yeah. And then you tap out and that's it. You wa I've watched so many matches where I'm like, okay, wait a minute. The, how... How did you call that so early or how did you let that go? So it's just. Yeah. I mean, and now it's the, the thing about boxing too, you know, with the whole Logan, Jake Paul, or was it Logan or Jake? I don't know. Which Both one. fought at some point. Yeah. Well, the big one. Well, now, oh, the one with Dylan Jake, Dennis. No, Jake is the one right now. Who's Logan was the one that fought Dylan Logan's Dennis. Logan's in the WWE though, now. And Dennis was the one on Twitter blowing up his chicks. Yeah. 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 With okay. I'm not a fan, but. But of course, as my twenty-year-old and my sixty-year-old, I, I, Ma, I, Ma, I mean, he's an adult, but uh, I kind of stay as much engaged as I possibly can. So we, it, yeah. The other day, I mean, and now like it's just all the social media stuff, right? Two social media guys got in a fight on a street, and and you know, it's supposed to be real, and I'm like, that's fake. That's not a that's real fake. fight. This isn't real. That's, and then now they're like, okay, now let's take it in the ring, like. And now it's like they want to sanction a boxing match. Like, Wait a minute. On. I've seen this yeah, before. Yeah, this is getting old. You know it was what I mean? hosted by a man named Vince McMahon. Exactly. This isn't real life. Exactly. And then, you know, with the whole boxing, I was calling BS on all the Jake Paul or whatever. I'm like, it's not real. It's not real. I'm like, why is it real? I'm like, because it's not sanctioned by any sta state sanctioning body. That's one of the first tip-offs. Oh, tip -offs. for sure. The fight That's was not real. Exactly. I think um, Dylan Dennis posting all that stuff of Logan's girlfriend, I think, it, I mean... Maybe it's fake. I don't know. But I don't think that his girlfriend or fiance would have filed a restraining order and then a, a subsequent civil lawsuit against Dylan not. Dennis, which she did. Right. She was granted the temporary restraining order, which Dylan then violated again. Right. Um, I hated that, by the way, because I was like, it's one thing to talk shit to your opponent. It's another to completely slut shame the woman that he's dating because you have nothing smart to say against your opponent that's, that's just dumb that's marketing. the way we are now and he lost and then now he's got a civil lawsuit which i would if i was her i would 100 percent pursue just to be petty speaking of, i mean not to change the subject no, go ahead. but this is a topic i would love to yeah discuss. what about the trevor bauer situation so that was one of the questions okay that so we're gonna is, get into it so we're gonna get is okay a, so i asked my followers for some juicy questions Great question. How realistic did you ever see Better Call Saul? I I watched a couple episodes. You're not a fan. No, it was kind of boring to me. Oh, I, I, you got to get past. I, or, did I have you a, watch Breaking Bad. I did it. My son binge watched. So okay, so yeah. then. So I have a problem with his lawyers. I don't know, but yeah, I have a problem with with legal dramas and stuff like that. You know, I, you Mike, you would actually. I really think you would actually like. Better Both call Saul. Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad, and Better Call Saul. I don't Saul. know why. So my my wife, I think it's private because my wife doesn't like 
drug stuff. She grew up around drugs, so she doesn't like to watch oh. that stuff. So we never watched Breaking Bad together, right? And so I think that's why we didn't watch Breaking Bad. Okay, my son fair. loves Breaking Bad. He binge watched it. It's one of my favorite yeah. shows of all yes. time. Brian yes. Cranston and the yes. way they made that. So anyway, I'll answer this question. Better Call Saul is probably one of the more accurate depictions of like the actual substantive legal things that they talk about, they obviously had a lawyer talking about those things because it's the two, it's essentially Saul Goodman and um, his brother and his love interest as they first started out at this law firm. It was one of like this big law firm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but it very much mimics law firm life. Everybody tells me I should watch it. Like so, they yeah. stick, they stick uh, one of, uh, I forget the characters, her character's name, but she uh, essentially did something wrong. And so they essentially stick her in the discovery office and just make her spend 12 hours a day just reviewing boring discovery call logs and stuff. And then her, you know, um, Saul goes to work for this other firm and they have a very specific style on how they write their their briefs and their memos. And it was just it's so reminiscent. It was during a time I was watching it during a time where I was working for a firm that I hated and they were doing this little stuff on like this isn't really the style that we write in and just like, you know, little nuanced stuff with writing, which I hate. It's just not my thing. And so they did stuff they picked on. uh, they picked up on so many nuances with that that I was like, oh, my God, this is insanely accurate. Along with, you know, if you do represent some of these kinds of people in your lifetime, here are some of the types of issues. I mean, I remember the first I uh, the first private uh, small pra- solo practitioner that I worked for had a case that was a... Uh, Drug uh, former alleged accused, not guilty drug kingpin tied to a Mexican cartel who wanted to sue his former um, mother and father in law because he lent money to them and they essentially didn't pay it back. And then when he got out of jail, they took that money and put it in another house. It's a, it's like a law school hypothetical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then when he cornered them on it. They sold that house and bought another house and then bought a property in Mexico. And so we wanted to sue them. And he did uh, took them to court on the money that because not only did they get the money that he loaned them, they got appreciation on the house that they purchased and then resold three separate times. Um, Cleaned up the money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on both sides. Yeah, I was like, yeah. all right, yeah. we we're just not going to ask questions. That was uh, that was I, I got a. I have a, I have a number of funny car, drug cartel stories. I've represented a few alleged, alleged small lower yeah. level stuff. And um, my investigator um, is a former law enforcement officer, and, and my my best friend, the godfather to his, his his daughter. And so we have not we're just not we don't work together, but we're yeah. we're tight. Um, he always gets me these just he's well connected and everywhere, right? And we come up with some doozies, and I'll never forget meeting him and I meeting in. Fresno, Tulare County, Fresno, to pick up uh, retainer money from our, our new clients. And it was like, we drove all the was way to it Fresno. Cash? It was cash. <laughs> and it was like 1.15 in the morning in an alley. And this is like so, probably so better call Saul, right? Yes. In an alley. And we're looking and our client comes out and, and, it's just like, if you could take a picture of what you were, you know, it was like, I'm just thinking, what are we doing right There's now? There's a this, scene in Better this Call Saul turn where out this, well. <laughs> the judge sent this kingpin's bail at like $75 million or something. And the guy was like, $75 million? Okay. Yeah. Here's where you're going to and And so Saul goes to the, like, the office in the courthouse with these massive briefcases and was like, here's the bail. Like seven. And you can tell the lady in the office was like, like, what do you want me? To, but like, this is, I'm sure real life shit. Like, uh, it, it, I've, ne- I've never had anything like that. I don't know like where that, I got but, this money but, from. But yeah, I, my, one of my mentors, um, mentor criminal defense attorneys, long, long, long time. He was, he used to be one of the 
primary uh, attorneys for the Cali drug cartel back in, Ooh. which is, yeah, he's got some great stories in the, in the seventies and eighties. Right. Um, so he was at the height of the cocaine era and, and he just, he would tell me some doozy, some great, some not to do stories as a lawyer, right? Things you would never, ever want to do as a lawyer, but that were just part of the, you get the, caught the up in it about, you know, LAPD narcotics officers calling him to tip them off that there's going to be a raid. You know what I mean? And stuff, you know, the old type, old guard, old school yep. stories, him having God knows how much cash, you know, at his house. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You know, there as retainer money. You know what I mean? Ten million dollars in cash of retainer money, you know, for retaining him for God knows what. <laughs> but yeah, just. You know those great stories. Now I've never, I've never had anything like that or even close to that. But I have a unique, uh, kind of a real unique uh, plethora and, and and spectrum of clientele and clients that I I I actually love and enjoy. From you know actors and enter entertainers and athletes to normal everyday, just people making a bad decision in, on a, a given day. Which is the more exciting one? Well, I have a great, great case right now. Actually, it, it's. It's a it's a sad case, but we're working through it to bring up, you know, stuff like that. So I have a case um, that I was handling earlier today. I was talking to his therapist and, you know, I got the HIPAA releases, the ROI releases, stuff like that. But my client adopted. Uh, so just thought it was your normal. got referred to me um, by a former client of mine, uh, a civil client, not a criminal client. But and he's like, hey, um, I'm going to send you this kid. He's in a bad place. Twenty seven years old. He's in a bad place, great kid, um, got himself into an issue. So I said, all right, great. So uh, the kid doesn't call me, his father calls me. And the father, um, you know, introduces himself, very nice guy, talked to him on the phone. His son is in the, his son was arrested for 245A1, which is assault a deadly weapon. He stabbed somebody in a, in a park at late at night. Um, so he gives me the rundown of the story, and, he, uh, and he's like, we have an attorney now, but... Uh, we hired him, and you know he doesn't return calls. You know the age old. Attitude. Well, tell me that all the time. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things, right? And he, and it's a mill. So in criminal law, like anything else, it's a, they have these mill firms that it's all the, they send all the come on. So you know they get the arrest reports every day from you know internally they send all the jail mail out and and they advertise the come ons. Oh, you know I'll do your DUI for five hundred bucks or whatever it is. So they hired. They didn't know any better. They hired this mill and. They have a different attorney that appears at their hearings every time up to this point. So I said, okay, well, first things first is you're going to have to, if you want to hire me, retain me, you're going to have to terminate. No problem. So they fire the lawyer. I talk to the lawyer to get the file. I'm like, okay, I see what, what happened here, right? So um, the lawyer, there, they set it for prelim. It was already set for prelim when I get involved. So first thing I called the DA. I said, hey, I'm coming on the case. Let's continue the prelim because I don't really know much about the case. And I said, yeah, no problem. So I get the file, talk to the lawyer. He doesn't really know much about the case. Uh, I meet my client. And you get, after doing this for a long time, you get a sixth sense of people, right? Mm -hmm. And you, the eyes, the eyes tell a story. Eyes don't right? lie. Eyes don't lie. And so I, I, I meet with the kid. I've talked to the kid. And a number of times I'm like, this kid just doesn't fit the profile of a stabbing. And the, the quick facts are he's, he's in an argument with his girlfriend. Um, he lives, literally lives across the street from a park. Um, and they're in an argument and he lives with his, his parents. And instead of going in the house, they, they, they're continuing, they park across the street at this park. It's one thirty in the morning and they park, uh, they're in an argument. And he said, all of a sudden I get out of the car and I come around and I'm arguing with my girlfriend. And all of a sudden this girl comes out of nowhere. It's one thirty in the morning. I don't even know where they came from. She comes out and she comes up to me and she's cussing at me and she walks up to me and he says, I push her back. Like this is a random stranger. Well, I push her back. And um, so as when I push her back, she punches me, right? And then this guy comes out, and I'm fighting both these, this girl and this guy, and we're just Are fighting in the parking lot. Yes, yes, we're fighting in the parking lot. He says, they start getting the best of me. I'm, I now go down to the ground, and he's like, I, have, I carry a little pocket knife with me because mm -hmm. he's in shipping receiving. He works at a shipping receiving place, and he carries it to cut the quarry. So he said he takes out the knife, and, and he said, they're hitting him. He's like, hey, I got a knife. I got a knife. So he starts going like this. And they're like, what are you going to do with that? They come at him. And he just goes like this. Like he, it, he's on the ground now. And he 
cuts the girl on the lower, kind of lower belly or waistline, small cut, and then she's like, I guess he, he got me or whatever, and they get in the car, and him and his girlfriend take off. So he doesn't hear anything for a month, and then all of a sudden, police pull him over, and right. they arrest him. Comes to find out, this is my theory of the case, my theory of the case, these two robbed him because... And they ran out of money. So, so they get, so the girl comes up to him, she, and we go through the prelim, and she testifies exactly what he told me. He, she walks up to him. He pushes her back. She says, I punch him three to five times yeah, in the face. What? He falls back. She says, as he falls back, his wallet falls out of his pocket. Why would you I, know I said, that? Unless- I said, what pocket did it fall out of? She's like, well, I don't know. I said, well, what, 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 where was the wallet? I don't know. Well, how did you see the wall? I just saw it fall out of fall. And she's like, it fell out of his pocket. I, which pocket? I don't remember. All right, so whatever. So they pick up the f- wallet while they're fighting. And then they they, they call stole the his wallet. They stole his wallet. They call the police after she stabbed. Of course. So they give him the wall. No cash in it. No cash in the wallet. Of course. Of course not. And he gets arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Well, I think you know, and this is this is my own fault, right? As an attorney, right? You, I took the case, and I'm thinking, okay, it's just a self defense case, guard variety self defense case. Hadn't got to know my client yet. Went through the prelim, did the prelim, got really good facts out of the prelim. Okay, set, they retain me for trial. We're going through this situation. Well, I start meeting with my client, talking to him more, getting to know him more. This trial's coming on. And I said, hey, um, the one bad thing he had, and the reason why I said, is he had a prior felony assault case when he was a juvenile. He got in a fight. And I'm like, this kid just doesn't fit the profile of this violent background he seems to have. Two felony cases. Usually I'm a big believer in where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I, just seeing this kid, I don't get this. Just this is not that kid. And then, you know, they alleged that he might have been, you know, he smelled of alcohol. I'm thinking, well, maybe it's one of those alcohol-infused situations. People drink, and then they snap, and they become different people. That's probably it. So I advised, I said, hey, get in a program. I want to get you in a program to try to mitigate, see if we can negotiate our way out of this, but get you in an uh, alcohol program because he had a DUI. I said, oh, he said, okay, fine, no problem. He does everything I say, always. And he goes in the program, and I'm talking to him, and then he starts talking about his therapist. And I'm like, your therapist? I'm like, are you seeing a therapist? And he's like, yeah. He's like, um, my alcohol program refers me to a therapist because of, they said I have uh, a history of trauma. And I'm like, what's your history of trauma? And he said, well, you know, I, you know just stuff in my, in my childhood. And I said, does it stem from the fight, you know what I mean, that you had when you were arrested as a child? He's like, yeah, but he's kind of not really elaborating. So I said, okay, I was busy at the time, so I kind of just said, okay. So I said, get me the information on this juvie case. Give me all the records. So he gives me the records. I'm looking through the records. We're sitting down. I'm looking through the records, and I see adoption. And I'm like, I look at him like, what? So my client had told me my two dads. He'd always talk about my dad's. My dad's this, my dad's that. Never talked about his mom, but then he would say my parents. And I just thought he had a biological dad and then a dad that adopted him, but both dads oh. are in his life, right? I, I, just thought that, I don't know why I started thinking that. But no, he was adopted by two gay men, and those are his two dads. And then I finally get, oh, now I get it, right? So then, um, so, so I'm looking, I'm like, Adrian, when were you, or when were you adopted? And he said, I was adopted when I was nine. And I went, oh, that's something's up. So comes to find out he was abused in the home as a child. He's the oldest of four kids. And he was the protector as a nine-year-old. His dad's told me he was the protector. His DCFS has said he had been the protector of, the, of his three younger kids. He, they were in the foster care system for two years going from foster home. They went to five different foster homes before they were... They were adopted um, by the, the dads and a, be, a pattern of abuse in the foster home and all this. And again, he's the, he's the, the protector, right? And um, his dad told me, you know, one of the things that he would do when we first got him is we would, um, we would have dinner and he would be hiding food in his pocket. Yeah. And we would go back to his room and he would stash all this food and we'd be food scarcity there. mentality yeah and and because he would he or people one of would things, take it from him his mom would leave them for periods of time and they were by themselves 
So he would have to go out as the oldest and he would steal food from like stores, steal for us so that he could feed him and his kid and his, his younger brothers. And so his mentality was, I got to keep this food just in case they leave me, they leave us. And so he would keep this food. Him and his, one of his brothers were adopted by the two dads, but they couldn't adopt all four. So at nine years old, the family split up. He's never seen his two other siblings since he was nine years old. That's terrible. Right? And I just learned about this post pre I just learned about this a few weeks ago. And now my head's spinning. You're like, now now this I'm like, all makes oh, sense. it makes sense now. And so I'm talking to the therapist now. Now I have to go to the DA and try to file and get them on board for a mental health diversion to see if they'll. Um, Do they grant those very often? It's up to the court. You know, the court has discretion, and it's, it's completely in the court's discretion and whether they meet the criteria. They have to be diagnosed with certain mental health disorders that qualify. His, if it was PTSD, would be a qualifier. Um, and then there's an action plan, a treatment plan over a two-year period um, that they can put you in. And if, if, if they do all of it and, and, and successfully complete the program, they dismiss the case. right? Uh, but the offer right now is two-year state prison. And he just had a baby. Him and his girlfriend just had a baby. How so old now, is he? He's 27 years old. Oh, he's 27. Yeah, he's 27. I, don't know why I thought he was a little bit younger. No, 27. So now it's like two years in this state me- prison. This means a whole lot. You and don't really come back from that. You have don't, you? and that's what. And it's 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 a lot. You know, it's a lot of pressure. And uh, you know, when I told you earlier, sometimes I, I t- part of the, my fault is I take on these cases. And now that has like I'm up at night. You know, just like last night, I'm just like. You know, my head's spinning. And that's Do you like, have trouble sleeping? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Likewise. When, especially when these, ca- when these cases come down, you know what I mean? Do you I, do anything for it or you just got to, like, suffer through it? I suffer because I don't have any vices because I don't drink. I don't. I don't yeah. drink or, or smoke or do anything like that. So um, I, I within the last year, I really started working out. to, to Working out is great one. And that's helped a lot. Meditation. Yes, my, my wife turned me on to meditation. Yeah, there's a great guy on Instagram. His name is Yogi ba- Yogi Brian. Mm-hmm. He tells everybody to shut the fuck up and spend like five seconds right. with him and do some right. breathing and right. like centers you. And then he's like, you can move on with your day. Right. He's yeah. my favorite. Yeah. So yeah, those are some of the heavy, heavier stuff. That's crazy. Yeah. What do you think is a change, big or small, that? can be implemented in criminal court systems, at least in California, we can leave it to SoCal, that might change the court system for the better? I think an expansion of the mental health, no question, I think from a beginning standpoint, expansion of the mental mental health diversion and mental health, um, you know, availability of those those services, right? And and not um, be so quick to put somebody that has mental health issues in jail because it doesn't help because we're just exacerbating the problem. The problem is the flip side of that obviously is, is we're seeing a situation where it really seems like if there's a lot of lawlessness going on out there and from a criminal defense standpoint, I see that too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the last thing I want to do is have my family and you know, my kids exposed to, you know, stuff as well. And, um, but I think that we, you know, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't, I don't have, have the answer. answer, but it's the mental health side of it, right? And and the continual, you know, and I think pe- putting people in prison and not trying to solve the underlying conditions. Or is, at least give them one opportunity to fix it before absolutely. it becomes a part of absolutely. the permanent record. Absolutely. No doubt about it. You know, and the, for the most part, um, I deal with, with, you know, I'm private attorney, so I'm not a public defender that's seeing the same kind of recidivism coming in and out and, and constantly. So... I'm seeing. Most... I have her coming next. Oh, really? Yeah, she's awesome. in Sacramento. Awesome. So I don't. I deal with a different type of clientele, right? But um, for the most part, it's people that, and I'm probably. I'm venture to say she's going to say the same thing, though. Okay. Is that is it's people that just had a bad day, a bad night, a bad experience, and they made a bad decision. They just happened to get caught happened to get caught wrong. at the wrong time, you know. And I think for the most part, that's who we're dealing with. And I, I'm a, but there are people out there that need to be separated from society. There are people that 100%. are just not, they're not going to come back. They're not going to be helped and they need to be separated from society. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, I would argue removed. Right. I mean, yeah. Especially the ones that relate to like children crimes. I'm okay with you not being around anymore. Yep. It's okay. We don't need you. Yep. Um, 
you were ta- we were talking about DUIs mm-hmm. because I am a helper. Because I want to advise people what their rights are if they ever, and I, I just, this was, the DUI point was just to use it as a term of segue. If you were to get pulled over, what is a must in terms of what you are required to disclose to the cop? What are you required to answer? Good question. We always what talk about say? this one, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, before we get into that, it never, it's, never ceases to amaze me. Again, legal disclaimers. We'll not, right it's not advice, right? Not, advice, right not legal advice. <laughs> <They> but <laughs> in honestly, I can't tell you if I've ever seen one. But I mean, it's probably ninety-seven percent of the time when I review a DUI arrest report. Um, the one of the questions, obviously, uh, the police have is, "How many drinks did you have?" Anybody get, guess uh, venture a guess on how many drinks is the most common prevalent? Two. Really? Two? Why two? Not two? It is absolutely two. I don't know why it's two. I just know that whenever I watch cops, every answer is always two. Every. When I say every, I mean, and this is not anecdotal. This is my experience. Everybody says two. Why is it two? I'll tell you why it's two. Because they've been pulled over. The the reason they people believe uh, intuitively that the reason why an officer is asking them what they've had to drink is because they think they're messed up. They think they're under the influence. So. Intuitively, people think, if I say one, the cop is not going to believe me. If I say three, the cop is going to think I is going to arrest me and think I'm under the influence. Best, best answer is two. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is absolutely the deal. So, so okay, this is not legal advice, but uh, the, the, the issue is, you know, obviously. It's going to be well glaring. Know, right. It's going to be flashing at the bottom of the screen. Not legal advice. What is it? Okay. What is the obligation of a normal citizen who's been approached by police officers and asked the question? What is the obligation of the citizen to respond? None. There is no. There is no responsibility, right? Um, if an officer asks you how many drinks you had, other you than your ID, if they ask for it, right? So here's what I t- here's what I tell my. It's gonna say name and ID. I think is the only thing you correct. have to. Prove. Here, here's my here's my advice. This is what my practical advice is to friends and family. You get pulled over, you think you've been drinking, which I advise you don't. You shouldn't don't. drink and drive. Maybe Absolutely don't. not, especially with Uber, you know. <clears throat> if you're drinking, driving, police officer pulls you over and asks for your, you know, your ID and your and your license and registration, give them your license and registration. Mm-hmm. Okay? If the if if and there's proof of insurance. Correct. If there's any possibility, if you've had anything to drink and the officer asks you, "Have you had anything to drink tonight?" Don't lie to the officer, don't do anything. Here's what you tell them. My uncle, my brother, my son, whatever it is, my best friend, he's a criminal defense attorney, and he always told me to be really respectful of you, Mr. Officer, but he always made me promise never to answer any questions. He told me never to answer any questions. So he made me swear to him, and I'm in this situation. I want to – I just – I'm going to take his advice. I'm just – I'm not going to answer any. Here's my license and registration and my proof of I'm not going to answer any uh, questions, officer. I says, oh, okay. You're not going to answer any questions. Step out of your vehicle, mm-hmm. ma'am. Right? Okay, I want you to walk in this line, right? This heel. I want you to put your heel to toe or I want you to stare at my pen and I'm going to do. You know what, officer? My brother, my uncle, whoever it is, who's the criminal defense, same person that told me never to answer any questions, also told me not to take any of these tests. So I'm going to politely refuse to, these, to do these tests. I was like, okay, I want you to blow into this breath, little breathalyzer right here. Officer, same. <laughs> and I'm politely going to refuse to, to take that test. It's so hard to refuse, it though, because they get hard. so, they, like, they it is get, I remember one time copying, like, the slightest bit of sass towards an officer who was being an absolute dick to me. And it made him so much more angry. And I was right. like, well, no doubt. that's not you got to be prepared. Anymore. You have to be prepared for the consequences I, yeah. because the consequences are turn around, put your hands behind the wreck. I believe you're, I have probable cause to believe that you're under the influence of alcohol and, and operating a motor vehicle and you're now under arrest. Once you've been placed, this is the important thing. Once you have been placed under lawful arrest, okay, once you're under arrest, you are obligated under state law to take a, a test. You have, the, you have your choice of test. You could either take the blood test or the breath test. 
okay? But you are obligated to take a test of your choosing. If you refuse to take that test, then you'll be charged with a refusal, right? And your license will be suspended for one year automatically. Automatically. Right. But if you were, if you think or have, like, if you were below, so there's two counts, and I'll let you explain that. But if you were below, right? There's the A count and the B count, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's, it's P, or vehicle code section 23152A yes. and 23152B. The A count is just driving under the influence, mm-hmm. right? And you could be driving under the influence in California. Of, in California. In California. Under, under, and, and you, could, you could be charged with driving under the influence because the, the uh, blood alcohol level, the legal level in the state of California is 0.08%. Okay? So you can be arrested and you could be charged uh, and prosecuted for having a blood alcohol level of 0.07%. Yeah. So, so 0.01% below the legal limit. Why? Because there's the A count, which would which a Over prosecutor encompassing. exactly they can charge you with driving under, and there has to be some indicia of of in, uh, driving under influence, swerving, you got an accident, um, whatever whatever the the is is the additional evidence to suggest that you're driving under the influence. The B count is driving with a blood alcohol level of 0.08 percent or higher. Okay, so that's. If you're over a point of point zero eight or above, then you are 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 obligated, or you can be charged with that. So those are the two counts. Now, if you think there's, if you think there's, I would always so, say take the blood test. It's the most accurate test. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you think there's really no way you you're under Getting the influence, get the blood test. Right. If you think you are going to be oh, under yeah. it, get the blood test. The most accurate. If you think eh, it's a, it's I don't know, take the the breath test. Because can we can fight that. We have a better shot of fighting the breath test than the blood test. Especially and if you've done calibrated. all the refusing of all the things you don't have to do, then as a criminal defense attorney, now you're limited on the evidence that you have, to, you have mm-hmm. against your client. Mm-hmm. You now no longer have bad FSTs, field sobriety tests. You don't have a preliminary alcohol screening test, which is called a PAS test, that says you are 0.09. You don't have any of that stuff. to. Now we're just fighting the breathalyzer test uh, and whatever the original PC for. Most people don't know that. Most people just automatically assume if they get pulled over and ask these questions that they have to comply and do all these field sobriety right. tests. Or, it, I mean, and we're and by no means advocating for driving under the driving and no, drinking. That's, once again, that's that's, that's once not what again. I'm saying. But I'm, it's it's a it's what your legal but it rights is are for sure. Right. Everybody has a right to know what their rights are, and a right is you don't have to give those field sobriety tests. They're all they're just a they're just to further cement evidence. For the DA later down the line when you argue that you weren't actually drunk, right? From a, from a criminal defense standpoint, there's, there's, there, are, there, are, there are some truisms, right? And, and one of the truisms is, <laughs> for, the law, for the most part, is that there's a reason why you read your rights, right? And one of the obviously is anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. And it is it going to be used and held against you in a court of law. Absolutely is. There is nothing you can say to a police officer that is going to keep the police officer from placing you under arrest if he's already made that, 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 that decision to do it. And from a criminal defense, in, in, in defending you or defending or in your defense, if you get prosecuted for whatever alleged crime that you're being alleged to have committed, um, there's more leeway for your attorney to be able to... Um, advocate and argue for you with the more limited amount of statements that you have made that have hurt yourself. And the other thing I tell them, I tell them, we, my sons and I got discussing the other day, and that is people under stressful environments and usually talking to a police officer who is there, ta- talking to a police officer under a stressful condition where you think you may have done something or you don't know if you're going to get arrested, you, pe- a lot of people just start talking. And they aren't necessarily saying, you know, yeah. cogent things. And they might not be saying what actually happened right. a lot of times. There's a, look at, look at, look at the, the Central Park Five. Yeah. You know, and that, that's a fat, anybody that, that hasn't it, watched the documentary of the Central Park Five on Netflix or the, yeah. it is a must watch. That will change. You need to watch it. Oh, it is phenomenal. And for those that don't know, just real quick, the Central Park Five where the, five African-American black kids that were, that were found guilty of beating and raping the woman in Central Park in the 80s and went to prison for years and years. 
And they all had most, I think of the five, four of the five had under intense interrogation to, to say mildly by NYPD had all uh, admitted to raping and beating this jogger. And of course they were all minor young kids. What came it, out that found out that it, it wasn't them? I'm after, guessing this is after, after, after they were interrogated without their parents over a like, multiple hour interrogation they were beat they were pushed all that after all that happened uh and they were they admitted and they were being prosecuted they well before they were prosecuted after they admitted in the in the interrogations that they had actually done what the police were alleging them to have done when they got with their parents they said we didn't do it we just wanted to go home they kept on telling us if we admitted it we, we, we could go home we could see you guys and so, of course, nobody believed them. Um, this became a whole issue with Trump. And back with Trump, part of the presidency is had Donald Trump at the time had taken a full page article saying for the death penalty for these kids. And there was all kinds of stuff. It was huge news, right? Uh, they all went to prison for years. And then ultimately, when DNA evidence came out, it proved that they, in fact, did not, were not guilty. And they had all, and there was a number of other. Uh, stuff that came Which out and they were released a crazy perspective of when you talk about the death penalty or you talk about certain certain severe sentences for crimes where say dna was not involved like there are a lot a lot of that's the issue with the death penalty there's no coming back from that nope and, you but, can't and appeal a lot, i mean but there's a, a lot of things especially over the last 20 30 years where People have been falsely accused and wrongfully oh, yeah. jailed over crimes they didn't commit. Now, obviously, there's a shit ton that have, but like for those ones, you know, it's like how many uh, wrongfully convicted lives, you know, one, just one wrongfully convicted is, is too many for my opinion. But, you know, it is yeah. it's definitely totally crazy. Right. Yeah. It's so I'll give you a funny story about yeah. kids. So. My mentor, uh, chief of police, I think I alluded to him earlier, of, of our city, my baseball coach, he, like I said, he's a big, huge in the community, and he tells a very funny story of how policing was done in the 80s. Um, and so he was this, he was, uh, he, like I said, he was a community relations officer, head of community relations for years, which, he, which basically he was a school resource officer as well for all the schools in the city. So anytime issues, anybody had issues, it would come to him. He was the gang expert. He was everything because he helped kids, and that was his main focus. <laughs> he tells a great story of um, back in the 80s, he gets a call from a teacher, and, and, and she's a, I think it's a third grade teacher, second or third grade teacher, and young kids. So we're dealing with young kids. And uh, she says, uh, I think one of the kids stole my camera. So she's like, I want you to come down and question the kids. Because then nobody will cop to it. So they go down there and she says, it's, 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 it's one of these two, right? It, it's a brother and sister combo and they're always doing bad stuff and they're always doing shit. And I, I'm sure that they took the, the camera. What did they look like? I, they were just little Hispanic. Okay. And uh, so he says, okay. So he, and, and the chief, I call him the chief, he knows the kid's parents, uh, the kid's mom. The kid's dad had been in and out of jail. So he knows, and he knows, and the mom's, he, and he's, he likes the mom and knows the mom very well. So he knows the family, knows the history. So he, cut, he comes and he says, so I, me and my partner start asking the kids. We put him in the room, right? And we're like, okay, so what happened? He's give us the camera and, and you know, well, this will all be done. Just, we, we, we don't have time for this, right? We didn't steal the camera, right? And they're like, and and we're like, we know you stole the camera. We're using that tech. These little kids, yeah. right? Yeah. We know you stole the cameras. Give us the camera, right? And they're like, no, we didn't. So they then separate them. And they do the full blown. So now that he's like, and he tells the funny story. He's like, we're full blown interrogating little. You know, they're they're seven, eight Scared years old style. in two different rooms. We're like, okay, of course they're gonna cop out, right? So he's like, after thirty minutes, they're getting frustrated because they're like, we didn't do it. And then finally, they're like. Um, they're like, okay, we took the camera, right? The one, one tells them, the, the, the sister. And then he says, uh, okay, well, what'd you do with it? We gave it to some gangsters that live on our block. And they're like, what gangsters? And she tells them the gangsters. And of course, the chief knows that the yeah. gangsters, right? Okay, you gave it to them? Yeah, all right. So he goes back in the room to now 
confront yeah, the brother together. with that, right? All right, your sister told us that, that you, you gave the camera to the gangsters. Yeah, we gave the camera to the gangsters. That's what we did. We gave the camera. Oh, what gangsters? Wait a what gangsters? Um, it, it's so and so and so. -and -so. Well, your no. sister told us it was so and so. Yeah, he was there too, right? And they're like, okay, you gave the, you gave the camera to the gangsters. Yes, we gave it to them. All right, where did, you, where did you put the camera before you gave it to them? Oh, we put it in our room, right? Um, and then what did you do with the camera then? Oh, we gave it to the gangsters. Okay, you gave it to these gangsters. Yeah, they go back. And like, where's the camera now? Oh, it's in our room, <laughs> right? They're like, it's in your room? You're like, yeah, where's it at? It's under our bed. Call so mom. they go to the house. They go, call mom. Okay, we're coming down. We, the kids said they took the camera. The camera's in the, in the, under the bed. So they go over there to the house, and there's no camera. Can't find the camera. Camera's nowhere to be found. He said, we tossed these kids, these seven-year-olds' room, right? <laughs> and there's no camera. And now they're pissed because they're like, we're wasting all this time, right? These kids right? They can't find the camera. They didn't so they the go camera. back to school. They go back to school. They're like, we can't find the camera. No, the gangsters have the camera. You told, they're like, you told us the camera. Is that that? No, the gangsters. So they go back, right? Go, so Chief says, we go to the gangsters. And we're like, hey, come here. And they're like, what? Give us the camera. They're like, what camera? We don't oh have a camera. God. You have the camera. The kids gave you the camera. The kids did not give us a camera. We don't know what you're talking about. He's like, this is like Laurel and Hardy type, like just Keystone cop stuff that's going on. We don't have the camera, right? And then he says, we're going to come back in an hour. If you don't have that camera, you're all going to jail. We're going to, we're going to bust you for something, right? So they leave. He says, we get in the car, right? And this is before cell phones, right? So we get in the car. We get back to the station. And our secretary says, hey, teacher called, right? You found it. The camera. In her drawer. Is in her drawer and that she had locked away and forgot about it. Oh, my God. Well, first of all, LAPD would never have the time of day to yeah. do that shit today. Yes. You'd ne they'd be like, your camera's gone, buddy. Sorry. Yes. You're and, never going to see it again. And, uh, and, of course, Chief goes back and the kids are like, <laughs> and now Chief's like, oh, my God. We just mom wasted is gonna all be pissed. that time. And mom's going to be pissed, and rightfully so. So they go to the mom. And they're like, okay. But how did the <laughs> imagination that those the kids had so they, to say they gave it to the some gangsters. gangsters? So they go to the kid. They're like, why did you why tell did us you this? Say that? And they're like, we told you we didn't take the camera. You know, we kept telling we, you that. We wanted a story. We gave you a story. So the chief. So the chief from you know, and the chief. But funny backstory, he's a white guy and lived his whole life in the city, right? And, yeah. and he's, it's a predominantly Mex Hispanic, Hispanic, and he's the most loved person around right? from all his days. of. Well, so the chief is like, from that, that was when I learned, I really learned firsthand about false confessions and how real false confessions are. Yes, and about how that's a real dynamic. It's a real thing. And anybody that doesn't believe in false confessions has never dealt with a stressful environment. People, di different people react in different ways. I, I, I'm somebody that like, I, I can't even help it. Um, as an actor, as somebody who's like been, I, I, every time I get pulled over, my hands start right. like violently shaking. Like my throat gets choked up. It's, it's, it's an intense in like environment. No one should ever, Right. And then I have to think about how much shit I have in my glove box that I have to go through and find it. Not anymore. I would have to think about, oh, my God, do I have my registration, my insurance in here? Do I have to find this shit? You know, and the question I always got was, why are you so nervous? I'm like, because you're a fucking cop because I'm getting pulled over and I'm likely going to have to spend four hundred dollars on a ticket, presuming you don't arrest me for something else that I'm not sure now, as a lawyer, it's a little bit different. It's not different for me. But it's not. I'm always... And then, like, I'll go to, like, open my glove box. Mind you, half the time before then, I didn't know where anything was. And so my hand... And you'd be like, why are your hands shaking? I'm like, because you're staring at me, and I don't do well under fast pressure. I've always known to, like, panic, and I can't think straight. Like, fuck off. So here's a funny... So funny... I agree with you 100%. And it happens... Every time. So here's... I'm, I'm a criminal defense attorney, right? I hold myself out. I'm a protector of rights. I represent, that's what I get paid for. I represent, I feel confident in court. I'm fighting the man. I'm fighting everybody, I'm fighting the system, right? That's what I do, right? I'm strong. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to back down. That Have that, right? So chief of police, we're getting back to the chief. So when he was chief, he, he was able to, to, to uh, 
it was they called them executive consultants to the chief of police, and they're just civil citizens that the chief, you know, theoretically uh, will will consult in, in situations. If you know, it's, it's just BS, right? Yeah. But we got a we got a badge and we got an ID. Now on the badge and ID, it just says executive consultant, right, <laughs> to the chief. And I'm like, well, what do I do with this, chief? And he's like. You know, it doesn't, it, it's not, he's like, don't ever show it as like long. I'm like, of course I'm not going to hold myself out yeah. to be law enforcement. He's like, but if you ever get pulled over by a cop or something like that, you might show up, maybe they'll give you a break, whatever it is. Like, who knows? He's like, but you know, this is what we give away, right? I was like, okay, great. So I never use it. Like, never, ever use it. I'm literally on, on my way one morning to go golfing with the chief, right? To meet him up and my, uh, one of my best friends who's a police officer for the same department. And we're going to golf. And I'm on my way, and I'm speeding down South Street, which is, which is the major kind of street by my house. And it's a speed trap, and I'm going because I'm late. And Chief does not like late, right? And he's, you know, he does not like, so I'm, I'm going fast. So, boom, I get lit up. I'm like, oh. It's a sheriff, right? So he pulls me over, and, and I'm like thinking in my mind, okay, am I going to use this badge? Am I going to really do this? Like, no, nah, don't do it. Use and it. And I'm like, I don't want to take it. it, right? Why else do I? So he comes over. He's like, "License and registration, please, sir." And he's a traffic cop, so he's, you know, this is this is his gig, right? So I'm like, "Oh, here you go." And then I'm like, oh, God, "I see it's right there." So I'm like, oh. "I go, I don't know if this is gonna help, deputy, but you know." And he goes, "What's that?" He's like, "Oh, are you a cop?" And I go, "No, I'm not a cop, I'm not an officer." And he looks at, it, he's like, literally looks at it, holds it up, he goes, "License and registration, please, sir." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh shit, right?" So. I, he gives me a speeding ticket, right? I get to the golfing, right? And I tell the chief, this is, this is worthless. This I is showed this. bullshit. And he's laughing, right? Oh, because he's he like, knew. He, Yeah, he's like, you're lucky he didn't arrest you for impersonating a police officer, right? Messing with me, right? I flipped him and off. Then, and, then, and then my buddy, Larry, who's a cop, right? And he's loved it. He's like, he's like, who gave you the ticket? I go, S with sheriffs, right? And he's like, uh, he's like, oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll tie. I got Thank a bunch God. of buddies there, right? So... He talks to, he calls his buddy with the sheriff's department. And uh, I don't know if I should be naming the liquid, but it doesn't matter. I'll bleep it but, out. But, if but, you do, I'll bleep it but, out. But uh, he talks to his buddy. He's like, who gave him the ticket? And he's like, and he reads off the, the badge number. And he's like, oh. He's like, yeah, he's a traffic guy. He like to, and he's like, he takes what this stuff. What is it stuff. with the traffic He takes this guys. stuff serious. He's like, I'll talk to him. It's like their only he's like, sense of power. But what, what's going to happen is he's, your buddy's going to have to show up to court, fight the ticket, show up to court, and then he won't show up. Right. And that's how he'll win the ticket. He's like, Showed up, he's he? like, so I do it right here. I am this big, bad criminal defense attorney and I'm in traffic. Court. <laughs> that's the worst. Traffic court sitting there and I'm sweating bullets. Yep. I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm like, I hope this guy doesn't show up. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know how I'm going to defend myself. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm nervous. Right. I see this guy walk in, and yeah, I'm I like, knew it. Son I knew it. God, you described it. This and I guy said, that is was a guy here. that. And I'm like, now I'm just like down. And again, big bad criminal defense attorney. I defend the accused. People, people charged with serious crimes. And I'm here just nervous and scared for my because life. Because you know that those guys have a propensity to be dicks. Hey, for this trap, it's cost me 250 bucks, right? And I'm just like, this is this is my life, right? And then, bullshit. And then he, and then before, for those who have been in traffic court, they called roll, right? Uh, and if the cop's not there, the, the judge would say, okay, dismissed. Okay, dismissed. Officer's not here. And I'm like, officer's here. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to say? So then officer he calls my name, and then he says, uh, deputy so-and-so. And he says, here. And the deputy says, I have no recollection of this ticket. And the judge says, okay, case dismissed, right? He hey, showed and up he looks to at me, do that? He looks at me, and he smiles, <laughs> right? And I'm just <laughs> like, he had other tickets there. He just set them oh. off the same day. But he said, yeah, he, he just, just smiled at me walking out. And I'm like, wow. but that just goes to show you, like, here I am in this stupid, stressful ticket, <laughs> crumbling, right? Crumbling on the sheer weight. Because it's <laughs> the same system for everybody when you're on the, the, right. the wrong end of it. Right, right. I remember getting pulled over, getting a speeding ticket, and he wrote it as a school zone. And if I did, I looked at the math, I did like I did my own discovery beforehand. I was like, I was not in a school zone. He was just being a dick. But am I going to go through the whole effort of hiring a lawyer, fighting this? Maybe he shows up. Maybe I fight it. Or do I just, because I'm eligible for traffic school, just, and I know that judge, and I've worked for that judge before in that courthouse, 
and she's getting on the, the older side yeah. and she doesn't really follow rules by the book. Mm-hmm. Am I going to just like cop it up as a wash and not be able to, I'll just do traffic school. Right. But yeah. And you're like, damn, yeah. this system sucks. Yeah. I don't like this at all. Yeah. It's, it's, it's rough. I mean, it's same off, same deputy, by the way, that as I'm walking my kids. So one of the great things about, um, doing what I do is I, I got to walk my kids throughout their to school every morning. Right. It's one of my greatest, cause we live close to our little school and, you know, I can make my own schedule for mm-hmm. the most part. It's one of the great things, right? So I walk them every, well, for the most part, except for days I'd be in court, but I walk them to school every day. And here I see they're doing a, a crackdown. And this, this same deputy, this traffic deputy was gave me my, is pulling mothers over that are dropping their kids off in like kind of double parking real quick. The, dropping them off in the it school zone. Literally pull in front of school with lights on. And I'm just like, you know, if, it, if I had not been traumatized by this deputy myself, right, I would have been in there yelling at him, right? This is not fair. And I'm like, people are like, can you believe this? I'm like, I'm not saying nothing. Nope, I'm just nope, home. not this guy. No, I'm just going not home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're coming to me as the as the criminal defense. Like, can you believe this? Do something about this. I'm like, no, nope, I'm not doing anything. I'm I going, never want to catch going, a, a cop on a bad day, man. Yeah. They are scary. Oh, uh, you know, and, and I have a, like, some all my best friends are cops, right? Yeah. That whole thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I do, I, but and the the fact that these guys are knuckleheads and just the stuff. I mean, it, it traffic it, cops. Yeah, all traffic cops. Okay, uh, you ever represent the guilty party? Plead the fifth. It's okay. We don't need to answer. Everybody that one. deserve. Never, everybody never. has a right to competent and fair representation. I agree. I really believe it. In law I school, I do too. Because there's always mitigation. Everybody, everybody has a story. Everybody's coming from somewhere mm-hmm. and, and has experienced something, right? And there's, there, there's always mitigation. and Well, not always, but for the most part, mitigation. There's a reason why that person finds himself in that situation. And guess what? They may be charged and they may be guilty of something, but they may not be guilty of what they're being charged with. And they may not deserve what they're trying to punish them with, right? And so everybody deserves to be competently represented. You know what I mean? And... You know, by and large, this is a system of negotiation yep. and, and plea bargaining. Yep. Right? That's just the name of the game. This is what happens. And everybody, so most people are not getting off scot-free. That's just Everybody's that's, worthy of the right to have a negotiator correct. on their side. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but I'm a, a real quick, yeah. the, the worst client to have as a criminal defense attorney, anybody know? A truly innocent client. Because that is a tremendous amount. There are great stories that are. Uh, oh, I thought you that, were going to say because they were full of shit. Though. No, no, <laughs> literally, gonna... no, real innocent clients. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Because like, the pressure, just pathological the liars, pressure. But... There, th- oh, there are yeah. a lot. I fortunately, yeah. I have not had this situation in my career, and hopefully, I never do. But we're we're representing an innocent client, and they're convicted at trial, and and they're going to go away to prison, and they're going away to jail, and yeah, that's and, really scary. And you know they were innocent, and there was nothing you could do about it, and you didn't, you were not successful. And you see this person wrongfully going to prison, that's a that's a tough tough gig. And there are and a lot of attorneys, mentors have told me great stories. They're like, if you've done this long enough, it's gonna happen. Oh. And it is it's part of that this piece that just eats and tears away from your heart. And you'll never they said you'll never get over it. And I don't care if if you ultimately freed that person, you know, later on down the road they're exonerated. Doesn't matter. There's it, it, it tears it tears at you. There's a hefty price to pay with your law degree. And right. I like briefly touched on this on another podcast, but that's the part that no one really talks about. I think because people just automatically assume that lawyers make a lot of money. So like fuck your mental health, whatever. Right. But there is a mental health aspect and toll that it takes on somebody, especially from a criminal law perspective on your own mental health, on how your advocacy determines the outcome of somebody's life or future. And how have, how has that, has it always affected you? Has it affected you recently more so than anything else? So you read it. So I, I'm, I really say I'm lucky. I'm lucky in a lot of different ways. I grew up with two loving parents that adored me. Great family, great friends. I've never had a traumatic experience that's changed to me happened personally, right? That changed the trajectory of my life and my mental well-being. I am so lucky that way. I've 
but I've been around it. I've been around people. Some of my closest people around me have been through those traumatic experiences. So I've always been able to empathize and sympathize with that. I think more than the person that comes from a perspective that I have that I never had to deal with that, right? But last year, two, so I was involved with in some civil litigation for a very uh, high profile client of mine, not an actor or entertainer, nothing like that, but a high profile, um, very well to do family that I had been the personal um, attorney for the son uh, of this family for a number of years. Um, you know, getting out of jams, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and he got himself involved in some civil litigation with his cousin. Okay, and I'm not going to bore everybody with the story of what, but these two cousins of these two very well-to-do, very billionaires with the true B families, uh, family members, got involved in litigation that broke up the family. Um, and it became obviously emotional, couldn't resolve it, go to trial. Uh, and this is a five-year uh, five litigation uh, that has been going on. Well, um, our client had gone through a lot of issues himself, drugs, stuff like that, um, and had made representations to us that ultimately were found not to be true. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, and the other side uh, had subpoenaed uh, some evidence that we didn't even know existed. And, of course, it proved that... It's always fun. Right, that you know, our client was not being truthful about an aspect of the case, just an aspect of the case. We, I believed in, absolutely believed in my client's case. Um, aside from this this piece, right? Well, unbeknownst to us, I'm on vacation with my investigator, and I'm driving back, and and this is a high end piece of civil litigation, and I do civil litigation too. But it got to be to the point where I'm like, I'm not doing this by myself. So I brought in my mentor, uh, who's my dear friend, and he's been practicing for 48 years. To help. So we were co-counsel on this. So um, I'm on the plane and I'm looking at my emails and I find an email. And the email is a motion for sanctions in the amount of $225,000 against me, my client, and my co-counsel. And my heart drops. Yeah. And I'm like, what is this? So I read. And of course, they had subpoenaed the evidence. It came out, and they're alleging that, of course, we knew about the evidence, right, intentionally withheld it uh, and make all these accusations against me and my co-counsel. Totally untrue. Uh, but we got hit with the sanctions motion, right? And then we had to reevaluate our case, of course, and we had to voluntarily dismiss certain causes of action. They ultimately dropped the sanctions motion, but um, it messed with me. It, and for the first time in my life, for as a, as a lawyer... You, as a lawyer, if you've been doing this long enough, you're going to get checked and there are going to be situations where you may have done stuff and you look back and you go, mm, I shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, if knowing know what I knew now, I would have done it differently. You know what I mean? Um, but this caught us right out of the blue and it messed me. And, it, and, it, and it, I was stressed out. Because part of the thing was I, like, I brought my mentor into this and now I've exposed him to this. And I was feeling like, what the heck? I shouldn't, should I've seen this coming, you know? So it really, it really took a toll on me. And I started suffering from anxiety for the first time in my life. I couldn't sleep. And it was really messing with me, right? And now all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I, I was found with true anxiety going, wait a minute. My son would come home and go, oh, you know, I, I had a headache today. And now I'm like, bummer for you. No, no. Oh. I'm like, are you okay? Like oh. now my head is jumping to the worst case scenario for oh. and now I'm on that. I'm going through the rabbit hole for everything, right? Good Everything's for you, worst though. case scenario. That makes you like look at me, I'm all like jaded already. Like, yeah. no, <laughs> exactly. it must be nice, yeah. whatever. So so I went through that and it's I've you know, we've went through we got our butts kicked in trial, got a huge settle or a huge judgment against my client. Um that you know, obviously after but all you're that's not coming responsible out. For no, that. no, that no, was... no, no, no. But um it taught you, I, you know, tell you, you hear all the time, you learn more from your, um, from the hard lessons, not your successes, right? Yeah. And there's no doubt I've do learned more. Do you still more. have like a uh, lingering anxiety? Absolutely. That? Mm -hmm. So that's why I've had to do a lot of, I've started breathing, think more positive. Now it's like a, a battle it really now. It really sucks like, it's growing a up to be an adult. The battle, yeah. it's the like, 
I was thinking about this the other day. The I really wish I could go back to like my pre-traumatized self when I could sleep normally, right? Or like just go to sleep and not like wake up with panic attacks. Right. I don't live in that reality really anymore. So now I kind of just got to like mentally get myself out of it. But that part's just, it's torture. It's right. exhausting to have to always be in that crisis mentality of. Right. Absolutely. And, and it wasn't for my wife. My wife is a psychologically, mentally, and emotionally mature person. How, where did she get that? She's, she has been surrounded by trauma her whole life and she's had to deal with it her whole life. She had therapy oh God, when she was young. So that. she, she, she gets it. You know what I mean? So she was basically my psychologist, psychiatrist. Throughout the, and she was able to talk me through a lot Love of me it. a woman in therapy. And she could see me. She obviously knows me. Been, we've been together for 26 years. So she knows, you know, kind of, and she would be able to talk me through it and do breathing exercises with me. So if it wasn't for her, I don't even know. The breathing is so, so important. And so it's stuff important. I never did. Never, never thought about. And then the working out just, you know, Tired, a just tired exhaust body, yourself. a tired body just helps with, helps it. calm your mind down. Really, it you know also I mean? centers you. Like moving your body, getting yeah. your blood flowing, like really does put everything into. And I and I become a better lawyer because at first, and it's it's what at first I thought I was gonna uh, it's gonna hurt me as a lawyer, and it hurt me for a lawyer as a lawyer for a short period because I started second guessing myself. Mm, now I became it like, mm, am I gonna make this argument? Is this gonna expose me? You know what I mean? Am I going to go out, you know, on a limb for my client this much? And that's what I mean. I'm like, wait a minute. You have a you have a duty to your client here to make arguments mm -hmm. as long as they're good faith arguments. You know, being good faith arguments sounded in, in the evidence. You know, you do have to, as a lawyer, you're going to find yourself making arguments where you're towing the line and pushing the line. And if I'm going to be risk averse that way, I'm not doing my client a service. I'm doing my client a disservice. So that is a, something that I have you, is a constant battle too. You know what I mean? Going, you got to remove myself from the situation here and do what's right as as the lawyer. You know what I mean? And that's actually a way I hadn't even really thought about before. And in a way, like I've been dealing with that. Like I don't want to say or do something that's going to get me in trouble because mm -hmm. of how much it's caused my mental health in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. That I just like anything. That will get me in trouble. Like I'll stay away from it. But then also that like that totally does take away part of the things that make you a good Absolutely. lawyer. Absolutely, no doubt about. It. And, and and the the crazy thing is we probably you guys you you come in contact and experience with these lawyers that have no shame. They don't care. None they will say whatever they think is going to suit them in the situation. And you're like, so that's, many. That's total. That's so not even many. true. And they're representing stuff to the court. You're like, that's absolutely bogus. I think every lawyer that's not a sociopath, right? Yeah. <laughs> Deals like, with the what? same thing, right? And that, and I, my mentor, Bob Besser, is my mentor attorney. And like, we still handle cases together today. Um, and I would be, there would be times where we'd be in depositions in an old, a different case. And it was those proverbial depositions where there's six attorneys in the room, seven attorneys, five plaintiffs. Everybody's yelling and it's out of head. It's a show, I dog and pony show for the client. Yeah. Everybody's yelling, screaming. And Bob, my mentor, is giving the deposition. He's actually taking the deposition, right? And he's there and he's just looking at, at the deponent, right? And everybody's yelling and screaming. And I'm a young lawyer at the time. I've been practicing all of 10 minutes, it seemed like, right? And I'm just like in this room with, Going, what is with these high-end attorneys, real litigators, you know, that are really good at their job, right? And they're they're beyond competent. They're high end litigators conducting themselves. And I'm like, is this the way this happens? Like, I don't know. I don't, and they're just yelling and screaming and BS, right? And Bob is not doing. He's he's just sitting there quiet. And I'm looking at Bob, and I'm like, what the hell? Are you? And <laughs> and and uh, and and there'd be a situation, high stress situation. And I asked Bob, like, Bob, how did? What did? Were you nervous? Were you this or that? And he's like. Of course I was, right? Like a big argument or not that situation. But I asked him about that situation. He's like, that's all noise. It really, Just noise, it right? And But we were in a big argument and, and, and I'm scared. I'm like, we're going to lose this. This is a bad, bad, bad argument. And he's up there giving this confident just, and Bob is the type of guy who's been practicing for 48 years. So he's got that 
there's an aura about him when he steps in the courtroom. Like even the judges, just his aura about him. Even the judges, oh, Mr. Besser, you know what I mean? Good to see you. And, you know, they 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 just bend over backwards for he's and and, and you know, he's got a great reputation. And but he just it's like this oozing of confidence. There's no self doubt in him. He, he is not sweating that. And I'm like, Bob, how do you do it? He's like, you fake it. He's like, I am scared up there. I've been doing this most of my life and there is not a time where I don't get up and make an argument yeah. that I am not nervous is all hell and scared that I'm going to lose it every single one he's like you just gotta learn to be confident and, and be confident what you're saying you know what I mean and he's like but I'm scared and I'm nervous That's and and I and how many times does a client come to you and ask you or anybody ask you a question and they think oh you're a lawyer you know the answer right to, to some random question right you're like yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even, you fake it. even a criminal question. Somebody comes to ask me, oh, this criminal just procedural. I'm like, mm, I don't know. I've never dealt with that before, yeah. right? You're yeah. not going to say that, that but you're like, time. yeah, exactly. But that happens all the time. We don't know everything. Yeah. We don't know anywhere close to everything Most in the people law. people that even we practice gotta research their own it. types of laws Exa need a book to That's refer right. to shit. That's exactly right. Especially as a, like a general counsel, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. And, and I'm, that's, I'm a general practitioner for a lot. Of, I do a lot of different things too as well. So... They're going to come to me with a client's going to come to the question. You don't know the answer. Don't bullshit them. Just say, oh, I'll, I'll look into it, right? I got something I got to make sure. It depends. And I'll look into yeah, it. I'm going to look into it and I'll research it. And then you come back and now you are the expert, right? That's always the one uh, kind of statement that I've always loved is just when you think you have self doubt or that you're not oh, yeah. doing well, just remember that there is somebody out in this world confidently doing that shit wrong. Absolutely. So like you might as well lean into confidently doing it however it is because you're probably ahead of some people. I kid you. See, and then I see it all the time. Like somebody out there confidently doing it wrong. Not, what? To, not to get political, and I don't want to get political, but Alina Habba, Donald Trump's lawyer, right? Prime example. I didn't even know her name until you just okay. said it. Oh, yeah. So she I is thought it was other. John Eastman for a I, second. Isn't that what that <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's a part of it too. He will be my next yes. guest. <laughs> so Lita Hava, who's I'm not gonna I don't I, I'm a firm believer in never judging oh, another attorney being in a situation. Right? I don't like to judge attorneys because I don't know the, your facts. Is she the very attractive woman yes. that he had next to her at the yeah, hearing? Yeah, she's the one doing the litigation right on the And credit. I was like, of course she would uh, Right. Yeah, of course. I'm not involved in the case. I don't have an intimate knowledge of the true facts and the defenses and all. I see what I see. I'm a lawyer. I'm a competent lawyer. I know basically what's going on, right? I'm not dealing with the client, right? I get that. that that's, a, that's a huge thing. But come on. The stuff she is saying is, is preposterous on its And if you're a lawyer, you even know to it's more fair, preposterous. To be fair, I don't know that you could represent that guy and not... Not, you have to be. Okay. So the I'm same get, way I'm, that Elon Musk said he, he was going to hire all the lawyers for Tesla, and they literally had to be sharks. And by sharks, he means scary. Like, absolutely. So but all that to say is it, she's making preposterous arguments but she's on its face, but she's confident. Don't and respect. everybody talks shit about it. And I'm like, I agree. It's, a, it's an absolute clown show. But I'll tell you what. You know what I do? I do, Emily? How confident she is, and how she looks like she it'll believes. It'll probably be. Yes, that she's trying. It'll probably it'll, be effective. Yeah, exactly. It, if if a jury believes yeah. you, if a jury is behind the shit you're saying, uh, yeah. I don't know what the statistic is. I know it's probably out there, but I guarantee you, it has some sort of effect to on. Stand up there and say that, that stuff, right? With the comment, I'm like, hmm. I mean, I'm I'm gonna give you your props for that. The Lulu you know all the way I mean? for me if I'm rep if that's my client. You know what? I'm throwing this out the window. I don't. I don't know how you do it. I said I don't want you political, but I don't. I, I, well, if whatever, I don't. Talk about I, client I, I management not, and maintenance. I don't, have, I don't have. I don't got products or like deals that somebody's gonna pull the plug if I get a little political on here. A, a lot of these questions have been answered, and I know we're like we're we're running on. Ooh, we're running on time. But I did want to ask this question early on. It's an excellent question. What's your opinion on how the whole Bauer situation went down from both a criminal and sports law perspective? Great question. It's an excellent question. I was like, I didn't even think about it. But well, let's Great question, because I will fully admit that it's one of those times where you get checked, right? As a, I, as a defense attorney, right? My job is to say, wait a minute. 
let the facts come out in a court of law, right? Admissible evidence that has been that has been tested. And that is that is where we will reach the truth. I'm not going to. My only question is mm-hmm. if they've been maintaining and maybe this is my ego, like being a little upset at this woman saying the shit she said on on that phone. Why didn't that come out sooner? Why didn't that phone or that that recording of that woman or the the text of that woman saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to literally plant myself and rope this guy into a, a bad. Why did it wait until months after this investigation concluded that that that, that came out? I don't know the real answer to that question, right. but I would surmise that there may be some kind of protective order that might have been in place. Um, that where the lawyers themselves could not divulge that situation, and uh, Trevor Bauer's have been lawyer did it. Maintaining, maintaining right. that the whole time, right? That he was not. Maybe there's some kind of protective order. That's number one. Number two is that there, even though he prevailed in the in the restraining order hearing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there was still an ongoing criminal investigation going on. I think that it came to a point where. The lawyers probably advised them, we're not going to do this because the last thing we want to do is get into uh, a, an argument over the state of the evidence at this For point. Sure. You know what I mean? And then once they announced that there's, there's, they're not going to prosecute him, they'd won the civil case at mm-hmm. that point. Mm-hmm. Probably any kind of protective order had, had extinguished at that point. Then they're able to come out and, and divulge that information. I think that's probably yeah. likely what happened. I don't, but I don't know the specific. I mean, it's probably a little bit similar to Alec but, Baldwin. Did you but hear about that? yeah, but the, but the 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 conversation is chilling. The thing she was saying, honestly, it's disgusting. I was like, whoa, yee. you know it's, what I mean? And 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 that was that that's what they call a pretext call in criminal law. Okay, so what a pre how a pretext call is this goes this. So obviously in California we live in a in a, a you there. There, you can't eavesdrop. Right? There's no mm-hmm. e- there's an eavesdropping statute in the state of California where you need two-party consent to mm-hmm. record any kind of conversation, mm-hmm. right? That's not in the public. There's an exception to that. And the exception to that is when the uh, person when you can record somebody's conversation if they're extorting you, right? Or they're accused of certain enumerated crimes with the law enforcement. It can be done with law enforcement. So they call it a pretext call. So for instance, in this kind of alleged sexual assault case, that's one of the enumerated exceptions. She goes to the police. She files this 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 complaint, and the police say, "Okay, we're going to call now. We're going to be on the line, and we're going to record the conversation. And you're going to call him, and you're going to have a conversation. And basically, what you're going to do is you're going to try to get him to admit that he did or he he acted in the way you're alleging he acted. And then we're going to use that as evidence later, right? And that's an exception. You can eavesdrop and record that conversation. So." When you listen to that call, what people also don't understand is you should also listen to it with the knowledge that there's a police officer on the other line that's recording that call, and they've been coached and instructed to ask certain questions to elicit certain responses that they can use to prosecute him later on down the road, right? So there are questions oh. that they're specifically asking, right? And when you hear her talk, you're like, of course. You know, if you know that, when you, li- you listen to it again, It'll, t- it'll change, even change your perspective more on that. But the things that even that she's saying in, in trying to get him to elicit responses are just like mind-boggling. And she's admitting that he t- she, she told him to hit her, right? And then she said she won't, you Well, know. she fully just said, here's, I'm just going to rope this guy in, literally step by step, said, I am going to frame this man and ruin his life. And the thing that really pisses me off as a female who understands like just in getting the prosecution alone would have been a uphill battle for her had she been telling the truth now since she's done that how many people are a going to be afraid to come forward or b are not going to be prosecuted and now i mean i hope she gets prosecuted so that's the other i hope she goes to jail my wife who is like is you know Pro woman and and she's she my wife's a believer. Like, I felt like oh, an of course asshole. he did it, right? Of course, and of course he did I'm it. Saying, of course he did it too, right? I mean, it is what it is. In the day and age of people not believing, yeah, when right. I when I shared the 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 phone call she's with I, it, she's so like, mad. She's, she looks at me, she goes, <laughs> 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 like, uh oh, <laughs> we missed this one, but it it hurt it hurts going forward. It hurts every yeah. other every other true victim 
right? In a situation like this. But think of the stress and anxiety that he, that went, he went through. A lot. Also thinking that he may be criminally prosecuted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And knowing he didn't do anything wrong, and it and it ruined his career. Ruined. He's although out of they, Major League Baseball. He's in Japan. They said, uh, well, they did say his uh, his two agents or slash lawyers are shopping him around yeah. to MLB teams. Yeah, I mean they're trying, and it's hard because from an organizational marketing standpoint, you're like, well, there's still, you know, there's still going to be half the population that still think he did that, it. That 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 you can't still, change their mind. They're never going to change their mind. So is it worth it? to bring him in at this point and have to deal with the community relations backlash that we may get or we're going to get from a certain segment of the population. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know. And, I wonder and, if he'd be willing to talk. I mean, I think if he pitched it in a way that came forward about it, not through his agents, not through his lawyers, not through a PR team, and just was like, this is what happened, I think you'd buy a lot more people right. rather than hiding and just shopping yourself out and then showing up when you have a jersey on. I think I think there are some steps that you can do as a public figure at the outset, but it's got to be on you and your terms and it can't be bullshit. And it's got to be like, look, this is what happened. And, you know, I think you might buy some people back. I you know how many people are making excuses for people doing all kinds of misconduct these days and they're just like excusing it because they like their personality? Absolutely. I, that's the problem, right? You're evaluating who your client is, right? And we as lawyers always are always in a constant evaluation of how does your client come across? Yeah. And he, doesn't. And he, and he does not come across. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough one. I mean, I, I admit, I mean, yeah, we were wrong on that one. We, we, I think it's a good lesson for all of us, right? Um, Unfortunately, it's not the lesson you want to be taught. You know, it would have been much, much easier for him to have done what he was accused of doing. Because now we have to look at ourselves and go, well, we went along with with you know, pointing our fingers at somebody that didn't do what he was alleged to have done. We were we were complicit in some way in that regard. You know what I mean? So yeah. that sucks. You know what I mean? That that has a it takes a real toll. But I, maybe it's a good lesson for. Yeah. But I mean, we never know the full story, I think, is the lesson. Like, we will never, regardless of what we think we know with anything, unless we are working for the DA's office or the LAPD, like, you just won't know all of the facts. You don't. You and don't even then, that. you may not have all of the facts. You may have all the evidence that you think you have, but you may not know everything um, unless you've actually been through it or witnessed it. That's right. It's a tough call. And as a defense attorney or any attorney, right, representing a client, you run into those situations all the time. Right? How much do you cooperate? What are you going to do? What evidence you put forward? It's a tough one. Yeah. It's a tough deal. Well, JD, this was an amazing conversation. And every time you you we talk, it always I always end up learning something. So if you were watching, I hope you learned something today or at least got your little noggin pro Probed? No. Provoked? No. You better be careful of uh, <laughs> some of the adjectives. I hope it got your, I hope it got your brain muscles tingling. <laughs>